Hello and welcome back to this Damn for Idealistic Crusade. This video is my review of the Arrow Video Bruce Lee at Golden Harvest set, which is available on both Blu-ray and 4K UHD formats. I will be reviewing in particular the 4K UHD version in the limited edition box set, which unfortunately is already sold out, but is the same uh, contents-wise as the standard edition, which is still in print, but unfortunately is getting closer to being sold out. So. This is very much an example of uh, act quickly or it's going to sell out as the limited is already shot up on the used market and so will the standard version. Now Arrow has announced that they are doing uh, standalone special edition releases of the feature films, which thankfully will include all of the extras, including the must watch final game of death documentary. So you will be able to look at these uh, spectacular 4K restorations and the spectacular extras package that Arrow has put together for each film but unfortunately you will lose out on the box set exclusives in terms of the sort of physical swag the wonderful hardbound book the fold-out poster and also uh, some of the disc contents particularly the vintage documentaries presented on their own discs so the standalone versions will be the feature film discs with their extras plus some of the other supplements so you're getting basically the bulk of the overall package of supplements but you are not getting the full uh, complement which in the box set actually totals somewhere around 65 hours of supplemental material so this is definitely one of those box sets that uh, even even if you're just a passing fan of, of Lee's unfortunately short filmography, this is definitely an example where it is a good idea to just go for the whole box set because you will be able to do a complete deep dive into not just the world of these films, but the world of Golden Harvest and Hong Kong filmmaking at that time period. So it, it is very much just a, a comprehensive package that really just outclasses everything that has come before but thankfully since the whole box set is about to be uh, completely sold out at most retailers uh, there will be standalone versions for people to pick up which will be also much less expensive but uh, do keep in mind you will lose out on quite a bit of on disc and uh, physical supplemental material and all of the wonderful packaging and swag now i did talk about the films overall uh, and my, my overall opinions on Lee's completed films and the uncompleted Game of Death footage when I reviewed Criterion's His Greatest Hits Blu-ray box set some time ago. And since there's so much material to go over with this box set and so much packaging and again 65 hours of supplemental features and quite a bit of transfer notes to get into, uh, I, I won't necessarily be doing my, my usual sort of deep dive into the films because I've already done that in another video and there's just so much to go over that I want to keep this focused focused on the uh, particulars of the Aero box set, the new 4K transfers, the HDR grading, the new audio harvest, the alternate cuts, and all of the supplements. So I'm going to go through this set uh, disc by disc, I think is probably the best way to do it. And since there are 10 discs in this set, and again, 65 hours of supplements, there, there's, there's quite a lot to go through. So that's why I think it's probably best for me to go through disc by disc and do a detailed examination of each. So disc one is for The Big Boss, which is here in its brand new 4K restoration scanned directly from the surviving original camera negative and given a beautiful Dolby Vision HDR grade in addition to a grading for HDR10+, and SDR, which of course was used for the Blu-ray, which is available in the uh, standalone Blu-ray version of this set. Now, as I said in my uh, previous review of the Criterion box, and when I'm talking about the actual films, The Big Boss is obviously not exactly what Bruce Lee was trying to do with the films he was making. 
uh, but it's at least the one that you can see the promise that's that's going to be fulfilled, and you can see the the seeds being sowed of what Bruce Lee would would come uh, to do, particularly in the way of the dragon when he had full creative control and actually directed the film. Uh, so there there's a, there's a bit of, of of a struggle in the big boss between the sort of old style and new style of Hong Kong filmmaking that uh, again is what Lee was really trying to push forward. But there's there's something about that sort of schism that that makes me appreciate the film even more and the fact that it was early on for golden harvest so it, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of like a a, a ragtag effort you know of uh, of a scrappy little film trying to uh, you know punch above its level and succeeding even though it's it's not quite what lee would have liked to have done himself had he been left to his own devices so for for those reasons, it's it's actually probably my favorite overall of the films, even though it's it's very obviously not the most technically polished of the films, and uh, it, the way of the dragon is obviously the the film that Lee had the most control over and is the most representative of what he was trying to do with his films. So I think Way of the Dragon is the most Bruce Lee film. But if I had to choose my favorite, I think the big boss just still slightly edges out Way of the Dragon because of that sort of uh, that that sort of first film energy and that 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 sort of this is all completely new and here's some elements trying to break through the sort of uh, textbook set defined Hong Kong style of of cinema that's also. You know, get you know, it's gotten very much uh, quite a bit stodgy, and so you you need that that fresh blood every once in a while. So, in that sense, and also because Lee was a, a you know very obviously a big fan of Sergio Leone, it very much has that 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 sort of feeling of a fistful of dollars being that sort of watershed moment, a new sort of breakthrough, and a new sort of genre defining moment. So, uh, it, it's it's very much been a film that has not been handled the best over time, and as soon as you pop in this disc and you look at the new 4k presentation and you see the work that's gone into these and you know how the films have been handled before on uh, in their hd masters particularly on blu-ray in a variety of different editions that had loads of issues and even had to be recalled and recolor graded and and messed with further on the various uh, shout factory releases not to mention how fortune star likes to handle their films and uh, frequently you know use upscales or have screwy color timing or screwy audio or remixes only uh, and then what turned up on the criterion box unfortunately had pretty terrible color grading uh, that that really marred uh, pretty much all the films of course uh, except enter the dragon which of course was a was a newer warner brothers scan and not handled by fortune star um, so that that made the criterion box really tough to sit through because the color was uh, quite poor throughout because of some unfortunate revisionist color grading choices by Richard Vada and others, which is unfortunately common to a lot of films handled by Fortune Star. So to get to this box set and see these new transfers and see particularly the ones like the Big Boss from the original camera negative, uh, to talk about the picture quality, you have never seen this film look like this before. It is astonishing throughout the level of detail that comes across and entirely without the color timing problems of the previous HD masters, particularly what's on the Shout Factory and Criterium releases. So right off the bat, the color timing issue is completely addressed and fixed. And the, the, uh, it is absolutely miraculous how good this film looks. This was not a large budget film. It does have some occasional in camera defects or lens defects because all of these films are in scope. And, you know, they, 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 I don't think had the best lenses necessarily on, on this film and they were shooting in Thailand on a low budget and conditions were pretty crummy so you, you do have to expect some of that is going to show up in the production which it does it's all inherent to uh, those concerns but again this master has been really handled it seems with the utmost care uh, it has not been uh, done to a degree where every original artifact has been removed or addressed there is 
very, very rarely a, a, a stray artifact that sort of makes it through uh, one or two tiny specks uh, scattered throughout the whole feature, and they are very, very minuscule. There are some moments where you have some very, very light marks creeping in, but uh, this transfer and this master has been done in such a way to minimize those as much as possible without actually harming the image. And so I would much rather have a beautiful transfer like this that has tried its best to handle inherent damage to the, to the negative without uh, being overzealous in its cleanup and also uh, damaging the overall image's effectiveness and the original photography. And some of this will be inherent to the original photography, so there's nothing you can really do about that. And so it, it's, it's best to have a very nuanced uh, approach that's almost more hands-off in ways in terms of not wanting to get in there and mess with the original imagery but to uh, clean it up and present it as best as humanly possible and if that means some faint traces of original defects do make it through uh, that that should be how it is as opposed to overzealously going in and trying to remove any sort of physical artifact and you know going to crazy town with the uh, DNR our application, which is unfortunately something that happens all too often. So not only do we have a beautiful presentation of the film with detail that has never been seen before, but also it has been done with a very careful and nuanced approach that also manages to have a careful and nuanced approach to the color. So all of the previous concerns with the film's image and its presentation on past releases, particularly in regards to the color timing, have been handled with absolute grace and this will be such a welcome treat to any fan of these films who have been very um, very disappointed, shall we say, in the presentation visually, especially the more modern color grades, which really do not belong in any catalog title. The, the uh, tasteful approach also goes with the HDR grading. Now, Arrow did go through uh, with, with their partners and their team members and did not just one, but three different color gradings for all the films in this box set in terms of the UHDs. The SDR grade was primarily done with the Blu-ray in mind. Mind. Then they did grades in both HDR10 and Dolby Vision. Uh, the Dolby Vision is very much the way to go with all of these. It is able to be more nuanced, more detailed in the, uh, the handling of the dynamic range. So if you have the ability to uh, play back and enjoy UHDs and Dolby Vision, you will see a noticeable upgrade overall compared to the HDR10 version. But all three have been done extremely well, and I did actually view uh, moments in all three. I, I watched the films in Dolby Vision, and then I went through and looked at the HDR10, and then I also looked at them in SDR as well, which of course is what you're getting on the Blu-ray. Uh, the, all three gradings are done to about the best degree I think they can be. None of the HDR is overdone. Uh, there are no, you know, giant sort of light cannon moments, which is uh, very, very easy to do in catalog titles on UHD and unfortunately quite frequently happens with a lot of catalog titles. So overall, this is another very tasteful, very nuanced and very careful handling of the visuals of these films and is another sign that this was done by people who actually cared to do these things as as best as humanly possible with the resources available. So I do think there is a significant benefit of looking at these films on the UHD versions because you're not only getting the uptick in resolution and bit rate, but also you're getting the lovely HDR grading, which is not overdone and also has a great HDR 10 grade if you don't have the ability to play back Dolby Vision. So uh, this is really good for everyone because unfortunately Dolby Vision is, is a lot harder to get a hold of. It's more expensive for televisions and players that support it. So you need to make sure that the HDR10 is well done and Arrow has done that. They made sure to grade all the films properly with three different gradings so that way it, 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 they, they would be handled properly on all the different versions. Now the UHDs are beautifully encoded. They have pretty much maxed out bit rates and they were handled by Fidelity in Motion which is you know pretty much the best in the business at disk encoding. 
So the UHDs here are absolutely as good as they can be on a technical level, I think. Um, Fidelity didn't handle the Blu-rays, but from what I've read and, and uh, looked at user reports, all the Blu-rays are also extremely well done. They just weren't done by Fidelity in motion. Now, in terms of the audio, uh, the audio has been given a complete overhaul as well, with new restoration work being performed, uh, making the audio presentations on uh, these discs far beyond what we had on the Criterion box, which unfortunately suffered from quite poor audio on a lot of the presentations that had aggressive noise reduction or uh, just were not to the quality level they should be, particularly Fist of Fury had a lot of hum in it. Its, uh, original Mandarin track. So um, it was great to see that Arrow was doing new work on the audio, and the audio is significantly improved, just like the picture. Now, The Big Boss includes many different audio options, just like all of these films, which had a variety of releases and honestly completely different release histories in different countries, and uh, that's why Arrow has also included a lot of different cuts of the films that they've had to mostly reconstitute uh, from uh, looking at other sources and then using the new 4K masters to reconstitute that cut that they would have to do manually. Now, here on The Big Boss, we have multiple mono options. There are two English monos, the original English audio that we would have heard here in the U.S., plus an alternative uh, Japanese release English mono track, which I think is a different score as well. Uh, then we have the Cantonese reissue mono track, as all of Lee's films were reissued with a Cantonese audio mix later later on that uh, sometimes had completely different scores, but the original track and what I view all of these films with are the original mono Mandarin audio mixes. And I really think that's the way to go with these films. It's great that we can still have the alternate versions for people who grew up with those or prefer those, but uh, for newcomers and myself, I think the best option is to always go with the original audio, which here is the Mandarin mono track. Uh, the mono here for the Mandarin, which is how I viewed the film, uh, it, it sounds dramatically improved over what's on the Criterion box set and is seemingly a brand new audio transfer without the overzealous noise reduction that was on the Criterion box set. So again, I think the audio presentation is just as improved as the picture presentation here. And it, all of these tracks are presented in lossless codex in their original mono form. And I think with the inclusion of all the different mixes with the different scores, I think it's about as comprehensive as you can be with the audio presentations of this film in particular. And all the other theatrical release films do have their alternative alternative audio presentations as well done in a similar way. Now, I should also mention about the English subtitles that you will view when you're looking at uh, one of the foreign language tracks. Uh, they are also newly redone and uh, are seemingly an improvement even over what's on the, the Criterion box. So they are credited as being uh, brand new English subtitles as well. So uh, they've, they've even, Arrow's even gone in to actually uh, try to work on the subtitles and improve even those. Now to talk about the packaging, uh, each of the discs is given this lovely custom digipack. Uh, very much in, in the same sort of style you'd see as the uh, little digi packs inside of an indicator box set. But they have, uh, instead of having a textured finish, there's like a, it's like a light gloss almost uh, finish that does make it feel a little bit more premium. They each have a little custom spine with the title, and when they're in the box set uh, or on a shelf all next to each other, they all match. And then you have a nice big uh, block of spines that all go together. And the limited edition box set has custom artwork that matches on almost all of these, except for Enter the Dragon, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, the standard box set does have different artwork for the Digipack. So the limited edition box has not only a custom artwork for the outer box, but for all of the internal Digipacks as well. So that's another sort of draw to the limited edition box if you, if you wish to get the limited version. But unfortunately, again, it is sold out and already going for pipe prices on the used market, but uh, should you ever pick up one of these, you'll note that the Digipacks have their own unique artwork. The interior has the disc with a lovely reproduction of one of the original Big Boss posters, and all of these Digipacks have some sort of original poster artwork on the interior. And then we have the straightforward but nice looking disc label that matches all the other disc labels in this set. 
And then we come to the rear, which has the, uh, the little blurb about the film and the incredibly extensive extras. Now to go over the extras, and I'll just go over because they're all listed out and there are so many that I have to go over the list to try and keep track of and remember all of them so I can go over all of them. But this will just give you an idea of how many extras are contained in this set when I simply go over all of the ones included on the first disc. So of course we have the technical credits uh, that this is a UHD 4K presentation in Dolby Vision, HDR10 compatible, of the primary 99 minute version of the big boss restored by arrow from the original camera negative uh, newly restored mandarin english and cantonese mono audio tracks two different english mono options being the standard mix and a japanese mix with an alternate score newly translated english subtitles plus optional subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing for the english dubs then we have two new audio commentaries, and this set has a bunch of new audio commentaries. None of them are ported from other releases. Uh, here we have one by David Desser, which is a really nice examination of the film, a lot of great background information. And then that is followed by a second commentary by Brandon Bentley, who is a diehard Bruce Lee fan who did a lot of technical work and editing work for this box set and who has done previous commentaries for Lee's films on uh, prior releases that he's also worked on. So basically this is him getting to come back and take a sort of second stab at uh, doing another commentary for The Big Boss. What I like about having this sort of double commentary format is the first track is usually a bit more like a traditional commentary, it's it's very good, but then you have it followed up by Bentley's commentary, which is a bit more energetic and a bit more, hey, look at this, and you know, let's 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 have a little fun looking at the big boss for the ten thousandth time. So it provides a really nice balance between uh, what might be considered a more sort of traditional scholarly commentary or discussion commentary, and then you get a whole second track that has a bit more energy to it. So you get basically uh, the great. Part parts of both types of commentary. So I, I really liked how listening to both, uh, and especially listening to Bentley's second, it, it makes a nice sort of balance, and you're also getting even more discussion and analysis and production background and information about the film uh, to further enhance your appreciation of it. So uh, I, I'm, of course, a commentary geek, and anytime I get a good new commentary, I'm happy, but to have two on uh, all of these discs is really wonderful. So the commentaries on this set are all first rate and all brand new and exclusive to the Arrow presentations. And here on The Big Boss, you get not one, but two outstanding commentaries that really complement each other well. Then we also have two alternate versions of The Big Boss. Uh, the first is the English export cut, which has a rare alternative English dub track with some scenes in Mandarin, actually, which is quite interesting to, to watch through because it literally does... Uh, switch languages at various points and then we have the 100 minute u.s theatrical cut which is what you would have seen on the theatrical release here in the u.s and on all the early u.s video releases and with all of the alternate cuts in this box set uh, what you have to keep in mind is these aren't you know just some old master that they took or maybe even a pal master or, or for some various source and just slapped on the disc as an extra no, what they actually did was they had to go in and take the new, beautiful, restored 4K master of the primary version and then actually make a conformed cut of that to uh, the various cuts they wanted to include. So these are all pretty much uh, 1080p versions of the 4K Master uh, actually cut and conformed by hand to match the various other cuts of the film. So that meant that somebody had to go in and physically match and conform the new master uh, well, cut by cut, uh, dissolve by dissolve, and then, you know, uh, properly match it with the uh, alternate cut original audio track. So that way you could actually view a properly cleaned up and uh, well-presented version of the alternative cuts of the film that have existed over time. And that takes a lot of time to do, and it takes somebody actually having to sit down and put the effort in. And I wanted to highlight that because that was something I didn't necessarily expect because it does take a lot of time. And just even thinking about, you know, sitting down and actually doing that, you know, obviously 
it seems pretty straightforward, but that means that you have to actually sit down and go and do that and reconstruct all of these cuts and conform your new 4K master to that. And then to actually present that in full HD uh, and encode everything properly is also difficult to do and something that most people and labels and studios are not going to take the extra time to do that and then to make sure the disc is encoded well. So I just wanted to mention that and that is something you see on all of the alternate cuts of all of the discs in the set and that's a level of effort and time and care that you just don't see hardly ever. Moving on, we have a new documentary entitled Return to Thailand, which has uh, Matt Rutledge, who produced and presented it, uh, actually going back to the original shooting locations of The Big Boss and actually talking to locals and residents. It's a very lengthy piece. It's, you know, it is a full-on documentary. It's you know, it's about 45 minutes long, you know, so it's all, you know, it's getting closer to an hour. And it's, of course, always fascinating to see locations then and now, but uh, he actually tries to get into the nuance and the uh, the actual day-to-day shooting operations and what it was like for the cast and crew. And especially fascinating are uh, his getting locals to talk about what it was like uh, when the film was actually shooting there. So he's actually talking to people who witnessed the shooting or were even on the set or, or had like a little bit part or they used uh, their um, their shop or their house or something to actually, you know, serve as the filming locations. And then he actually goes to the ice factory, which is still in operation. And you actually get to see the ice factory all these years later actually still producing ice and guys moving the big blocks around and everything just like you see in the film. And then uh, with then especially going to the the temple that served as the big boss's estate. And for the finale of the film, it's fascinating to see now, even if it is unfortunately a little bit run down. Um, it's just fascinating to see things like that, but it's rare that you have it done to this level of detail and actually getting footage instead of stills and going all the way out there and talking to locals and, and getting those firsthand accounts is fascinating. So this is one of the better uh, then and now uh, pieces that I, I've seen in a long time, and it's really lengthy and worth the watch for sure. Then we have an entire gallery of uh, all, pretty much all of the newly discovered, deleted, and extended bits of footage from the Big Boss, uh, which does have optional commentary by Brandon Bentley. So this is basically another sort of commentary track on this release and his commentary is great giving great context to what these scenes are and this is pretty much the same material that was discovered from that uh, primary original release print that miraculously turned up and that's what was used to create disc 2 which is the extended mandarin cut of the big boss but if you're curious about the extended and alternate footage and deleted footage in particular uh, it's been nicely put into a single a piece here with optional commentary so you can actually get the critical insights into what this footage is and why it was deleted and uh, you know focusing on alternate takes and different things and alternate camera angles so uh, it's really helpful to watch this with the uh, commentary track enabled even if you have watched the Mandarin cut presentation uh, you, it's really helpful to get that additional context here and if that wasn't enough we then get the not quite biggest boss which is a a video essay by Brandon Bentley talking about the footage that is still missing and the you know the, all of the rumors that have circulated over the years particularly around the saw in the head scene which is the most famous part uh, or scene or moment from the big boss that no one has ever seen perhaps outside of rare rumored legendary screenings and a few stills that survive so this is a really great piece that talks about you know, the things that still have not been found and discovered that we know were shot and do exist, but also the things that maybe were never included in a release version and all of the rumors and fan theories and things that have popped up over the years, which is also fun to examine. And, you know, you have to sort of figure out what you can debunk. So this is really important, especially for people who are newcomers or who have not really dug into this material and, you know, who, who maybe just take what everybody repeats at, at, at face value without really trying to dig into it and figure out what is uh, grounded in reality and, and what is more, you know, internet conjecture. Then we have some archive interviews with uh, Lao Wing and Tung Wai, which were uh, 
Uh, a lot of these archive pieces are from much older releases, and they have popped up on some of the previous Shout and Criterion uh, versions. So you will recognize some of the older extras that pop up, and they're pretty much all interviews that were done. In, you know, it seems like mostly in the DVD era on various you know DVDs in the U.S. and U.K. primarily, or Fortune Star releases. So uh, a lot of that vintage, or or I should say, legacy extra material has been ported over and split up onto different discs. So uh, there are some bits of previously made legacy extras that Arrow has been able to include in this set. So thankfully, uh, since a lot of that's been ported, it has, uh, you know, will continue to see the light of day and you don't have to hang on to every single older release for every scrap of uh, supplemental materials. Let me get another video essay, Bruce Lee versus Peter Thomas, which is in particular about the music for the English language version that's an alternative score. Uh, this has also been on some previous versions and was on the Criterion box, but it's a really great uh, short little uh, video essay that is important to discuss the merits and the differences in this alternative score of the film that a lot of people really enjoy. Let me get an entire alternate credits gallery, which is pretty much all uh, a standard def upscaled uh, as, as they usually have been on previous releases that included uh, alternate credit presentations. So there are a whole bunch of different credit sequences and title sequences done for the particular releases in different countries. So it's always fascinating to be able to see those when you have the chance to, and some of them will have uh, unique songs tied to those versions or unique pieces of music. And some are, of course, completely different titles than what we get in the primary version. So it's important to hang on to these and to preserve them where possible. And also they have included any of the end title sequences that are unique to those versions. So this is basically an entire alternate credits gallery of opening and end credit sequences that are unique to specific versions. Then we get an entire trailer gallery of Big Boss trailers that uh, is, again, pretty much uh, mostly compiled of old standard def uh, trailer scans and presentations, but uh, it's wonderful to have all of them in one place, but we also get an entire before the Big Boss reel, which is uh, dealing with films that predate the Big Boss, but are tied to it in various ways, and also a trailer for the Big Boss Part 2, which is a sort of unofficial quasi-sequel that is actually lost, and a lot of people really want to see it, uh, but all we have is this trailer, and it has thankfully been included here, so you can see what was done with trying to you know, essentially milk a sequel out of the big boss as part of the Bruce Bloitation craze that exploded after Lee's death and with his great popularity uh, and and needing to fill that giant void. A lot of people who had no sense of taste decided to uh, jump on that bandwagon. And one of those films was the big boss part two. So it's fascinating to be able to see that as well. There's also an Easter egg here, which includes a scan of a very rare Turkish trailer of the Big Boss, which actually does have some of the uh, unique footage that was in that Hong Kong release print that we see on the Mandarin cut. Uh, it's, it's a very wonderful artifact of its time, and it's a wonderful inclusion and amazing that somebody found it. Uh, so it's, it's a, just a real unique curiosity that is wonderful to see, but uh, it is hidden here as an Easter egg, and I commend Arrow for being able to, to source that from, from somebody and include it. Um, I'm just glad I, I, I heard that there were at least one or two Easter eggs in this set because otherwise I would have had no idea that this was on there. So that's another little uh, bonus treat in this disc. And then to close out, we also have a really extensive image gallery for the Big Boss. Uh, production stills, lobby cards, posters from various releases, and just a whole visual history of the film. All of the image galleries in this set are very well done and quite extensive, so you will be able to spend quite some time with them going through all of the extensive images that Arrow has put together. Now, the last thing I will mention, uh, for those who have a, a very trained high, I guess, if you will, um, you will notice that in some of the extras uh, scattered across the various disc releases, uh, when they use clips from the films, there is a slight 
lessening of quality compared to what you get in the main 4K presentation. And that is simply due to, uh, you know, trying to keep the encoding consistent and trying to save space where you can. So obviously they, they uh, slightly, you know, they're, they're not using the straight 4K master with Dolby Vision grading inside of a featurette or video essay or extra because to do that would mean you, you'd have to compromise space for the main primary 4K master. But uh, just keep in mind the, the clips and the extras are not always going to be 100% indicative of the beautiful 4K master itself because they are trying to save space where possible and or, and or just using the uh, master in 1080p for uh, the, the extras simply to conserve space where possible. So those are the entire contents of disc one of the Bruce Lee set entirely dealing with the big boss. And as you can see already, the amount of materials, the attention to care and detail that has gone into just this one disc uh, outdoes a great many other releases from other entities. So uh, this is really indicative of the overall quality of this entire set because you get more in just this first disc than you know some entire box sets from other releasing entities. So uh, this is merely uh, the, the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you will find in this amazing box set. Then we come to disc two, which is the big boss, the Mandarin Cut, is the title that Arrow has given this particular version. And what this is, is a reconstruction of the original Hong Kong release print that was uh, miraculously discovered. It, of course, is not in the best condition and did have hard-coded subtitles. So it is a very limited source, but to have any scraps of footage from this film actually turn up all these years later is just incredible. So I know most people like myself, uh, as soon as they got this box up, the first thing they did was put this disc on to watch the reconstructed original uh, release version or the long release version. Now this re restores about 10 minutes of footage. The, the runtime is now 110 minutes here. And what Arrow has done is gone through and taken their beautiful new 4K master of the big boss of the 100 minute version and actually gone through and placed the additional footage uh, or and deleted sequences and things in the correct place so it will actually jump back and forth between the lovely new 4K master and the scan of this very rare print that turned up. So obviously it's going to jump back and forth in quality, but they have actually given us a 4K presentation of this on a UHD with a Dolby Vision grade as well. So they really went the extra mile to present this longer version of the film in as best quality as possible for the majority of the feature. But do keep in mind when we switch to the uh, the print source for the alternate material, you are going to see heavy damage. There are hard-coded subtitles, but very nicely, Arrow, for, uh, because you're going to have English subtitles because this is a Mandarin track, uh, they have actually placed the English subtitles to try and cover up all the burned in subtitles as best as possible. And it's really well done. So honestly, it's it's not really a, a major problem or something that's going to be a big glaring thing if hard coded subs bother you. But you know, you do have to keep in mind it's miraculous we have anything. So uh, the fact that there are some missing frames and some jumps and you know uh, some scratches and you know hairs and all kinds of dirt and debris from all all the years of, of being handled in, in cans and such, you know, that's to be expected. It's it's miraculous we have any of this. But honestly, the switching back and forth between the, the, the 4K master and this surviving print scan, it's not really jarring. It's it's been handled in such a way that they they've seemed to have tried to make sure that while they can't exactly smooth over the transitions, uh, because the scenes and sequences are spread out over the course of the film, uh, it's it's not super jarring. It's not like you just you're, you're constantly switching back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There are some moments of that, but those are confined to very short pieces. Um, so this is just an incredible way to see the film. It is of course limited due uh, to the sources we have. 
And honestly, the thing it reminds me of is how King Kong was presented for the longest time. When they finally found, you know, I think it was 16 millimeter sources of the original uncut uh, pre-code version of the film and had to splice those in to 35 millimeter prints of the uh, production code censored reissue version, which is the only version that survived. That meant that you had a constant quali uh, quality shift. But what that meant was when you got to that 16 millimeter footage of the gorier scenes, the pre-code scenes, you knew you were seeing something special and it, it meant something because you knew how how rare it was that we even had this footage to see. And while the quality was obviously lower and not as good and it you know it definitely showed compared to the the to the other footage, it it, it just got you all excited because you knew this was something you technically weren't supposed to see and something that was lost. So that's that's the feeling I think you get here with the Mandarin cut. So um, if you've ever seen King Kong on any release before the Warner DVD when they miraculously found that uh, British duplicate negative of the, of, of the original 1933 version, um, that's how King Kong was for, for decades. That's how I first saw it. Um, so this, this is that same sort of feeling because when you get to the you know specific mandarin cut footage is like oh my gosh look at this this is fantastic so uh, again uh, arrow has gone the extra mile to make this presentation as wonderful as possible i recommend everyone obviously check this out because it is just miraculous we have this and we can view the film in this way but also for the diehard cinephiles like myself arrow has beautifully included the entire source scan of this print as a separate extra now this is a HD only. It is not a a, a 4K presentation, but it, you know it's obviously a limited print source and it's not necessarily something you maybe need 4K resolution for. But you can actually view the entire uh, surviving print uh, with all the hard coded subtitles and everything uh, in its entirety, start to finish, which is fascinating. And I, I love seeing grungy print scans and to see this sort of treasure in its raw glory is fantastic and it's not something everybody would do uh, to include the entire source print scan uh, in HD as a supplement and in spite of the damage and wear the actual print scan looks pretty darn good overall especially considering its age and the the condition and everything it's it's miraculous it looks as good as it does and Arrow has also uh, included the mono audio track and lossless quality as well so uh, it's a wonderful way to, to see the film uh, even though it's from this old uh, miraculously surviving print source but uh, it's it's a fun watch to watch it that way so uh, if you're fascinated by this footage you have the ability to actually watch the entire print scan with lossless audio as well so now we have the presentation uh, which is similar to of course the artwork for the big boss. And I like that they went for this similar sort of design, but made it unique enough to differentiate it as the unique Mandarin cut disc. And we have the same spine design, the interior with lovely original poster art reproduction, and a nice bit of vintage Flying Bruce artwork. And then here is the rear which shows that even this disc does have extras, which is, uh, you know, as I said, the raw scan of the Mandarin cut source print in 1080p. But we also have a brand new video essay entitled Axis of English, which is by Will Offutt going into extensive detail about the English dubs, the actors and writers and performers of them uh, for the main three original Bruce Lee films, Big Boss, Fist of Fury, and Way of the Dragon. And it is extensively detailed about all the various people involved in making the English dubs, how they were produced, how they were conceived and recorded, and uh, you know the fact that these people pretty much had day jobs already working for primarily the BBC in Hong Kong and would do these dubs at night in various sessions, but that also a lot of different people were involved and they sort of mixed and matched and there were different groups doing English language dubs of Hong Kong films and sometimes certain films, including some of Lee's films, had multiple different English dubs. So this is a quite substantial uh, video essay that, that goes into 
incredible detail. Now, there have been some uh, essays and featurettes made on this same topic, such as on the Criterion box that were good, but uh, none of them that I've seen have gone into this level of detail. So I think this is the best uh, depiction of how the English language dubs were made, recorded, and produced overall, and it gets into great detail about the people who made them. And then finally, uh, this also includes newly translated English subtitles for the Mandarin cut, which of course the newly made subtitles for the feature version, but with additional subs made for the uh, Mandarin cut specific footage. Then we come to disc three for Fist of Fury, which is of Lee's completed films, probably, you know, for, for the Hong Kong films, it's probably the most polished and uh, is is uh, some people's favorite of Lee's films, but uh, is is definitely the one that probably had the the greatest impact in terms of how it was received in its native country. Uh, so this this is still an incredible film that shows uh, Lee gaining a, a greater sort of. Well, well, at least a, a greater degree of input into the film, but it was still being directed by Lo Wei, who had directed The Big Boss, and uh, by the end of this film, uh, Lee and Lo Wei were not really necessarily on speaking terms, and they, they finally were able to go their own way, and then Lee was given authority to make Way of the Dragon entirely on his own. So uh, this is basically a transitional film between uh, what we saw in The Big Boss being the sort of film of promise, but Lee trying to break his newer ideas through. It's coming a bit more across here in Fist of Fury, but you can definitely feel the the schism between the the old and new styles represented by Lo Wei and Bruce Lee. Uh, it, it's much more apparent here in Fist of Fury, and then in Way of the Dragon, it's entirely uh, Lee getting to do his own thing. So uh, this is, uh, again, a, a really iconic film, as all of these are, but it's, it's wonderful to review here in the beautiful new 4K presentation. Now, just like the big boss, Fist of Fury was scanned from the original camera negative and presented here in a beautiful new 4K master uh, that was graded for SDR, HDR10, and Dolby Vision. I viewed this in Dolby Vision, and overall, it's an unbelievable upgrade over what came before. We don't have any of the dodgy, terrible color grading that's on a lot of the previous masters of the film. So again, that is not a concern on anything here. Uh, there is, unfortunately, though, it seems like there's there's qu there was quite a bit more damage baked into the original negative that they weren't necessarily able to do very much about. And again, with their very careful approach to handling these restorations and scans and overall grading for these new 4K masters, you will note some occasional artifacts popping up which do seem inherent to the original source. And they are very brief and very fleeting, but there's overall more of them than I noticed in any of the other 4K transfers. And it should be uh, stated and underlined that only the Big Boss and uh, Fist of Fury are coming from the original negatives. The other two main 4K presentations are unfortunately, uh, they, they apparently, I guess the negatives are lost or they had to go to the best surviving interpositives and internegatives. Uh, so that means there is a you know, a definite uptick to the visuals in both Big Boss and Fist of Fury as compared to the other films. So they are definitely the best looking on a technical level because they are the films that were sourced from the original negatives. But it is, uh, I guess, just due to the source limitations that there are more infrequent marks, little tiny scratches and things that pop up in Fist of Fury than any of the other films. These artifacts are mostly some, some very tiny specks of dirt here and there. there there is a tiny hair in the opening titles, but I think that might, again, that's seemingly inherent to when the titles were photographed. Uh, there are some faint lines that that try to poke through a little bit here and there, but it, you know, it seems like they, they tried to handle this stuff as best as possible while staying out of the way, which is how any restoration should be handled. I think the biggest thing I noticed overall is there's a particular moment when uh, Bruce Lee's character is first going in to the dojo to confront the, uh, confront the Japanese, and there's a very brief moment where there's some sort of almost like very just 
like like a sort of faint yellow uh, spot on or, or spots on the the frame, and they're they're very brief, so they kind of just flash by. Uh, but if if you notice things like this, you'll you'll notice that. And I don't know if it was maybe just a, a, a bad splice or, or or somehow that that particular um, those, those particular frames got got damaged in that way. But that that is all of this stuff is inherent to the source and. There's nothing you can really do about some of those things without getting into overzealous uh, cleanup territory that is not what Arrow is doing here. So of the 4K masters in this set, uh, Fist of Fury is the one that has the most number of, of inherent artifacts and things pop up. But they are all, except for that that moment, they were all you know pretty minor and understandable and seemed to be just inherent to, unfortunately, the original negative. And you know, it's it's amazing that we are even able to scan the negatives. But, you know, outside of these artifacts, the level of detail here, just like in the big boss, is revelatory. You have never seen Fist of Fury presented like this ever. Uh, it is just miraculous that it, it finally looks this way and without any color timing issues. Uh, is just, uh, again, phenomenal. Now, in terms of the HDR grading, I viewed the film in Dolby Vision, and I also checked the HDR10. Um, it looks great, and it is done in a way that is just like the big boss, where it's obvious that somebody took the time and care to uh, make sure the film looked as it should and not to get too crazy with the HDR. However, of the films in this set, this is the one that... I thought that some of the HDR, at, at least for my taste in Dolby Vision, was a little bit bright in areas and in certain spots. Uh, but again, I, I am kind of leery about HDR being used for catalog titles in, in the first place. Uh, this is by no means uh, like something you might see in a Sony presentation that has the what has been termed the light cannon effect, where you're almost blinded by uh, there being too much brightness in certain parts of the frame but there there were definitely some moments where it, it felt to me personally that uh, they, that there were some areas that were maybe a little bit too bright that was that was maybe a little bit distracting but um, that may be just um, from my own personal taste um, but I this was the one uh, one 4k master of all of the masters in the set that uh, I, I kind of had a, a little bit of a quibble about some moments of the HDR and there have been some others who have uh, mentioned that uh, there there are some moments where it seems like maybe the white balance is a little bit different or a little bit off and that there might be a, just a tiny bit of color fringing here and there. Um, I noticed, uh, I, I think that might go, go with what I'm talking about, about the HDR maybe seeming a little bit bright in spots because it is primarily on, you know, on whites in particular and in terms of clothing or walls or light sources. Um, that's always what HDR is, is going to bring out more and what's going to seem brighter than usual. But it just seemed like there were just maybe a few spots where the HDR was was a little bit brighter in Dolby Vision. Uh, looking at it in HDR 10 did, you know, sort of tame some of that, but also uh, the rest of the HDR 10 grade was not as nuanced and detailed as the Dolby Vision. So again, it all comes down to personal preference. And uh, I think this is still an exceptionally well done grading but I just think there were maybe one or two spots I had a little quibble over that I, I didn't have that that same particular issue with with the other uh, 4k presentations and HDR grades but I just thought it was something I should mention because I think other people are, are might notice this or I've seen some discussion about the overall um, HDR presentation of Fist of Fury in particular just seems a, a little bit different but I, I don't want to negate the amazing uh, positives of the visuals of this master. This is, you know, to say it is the best Fist of Fury has ever looked is not... <laughs> does not even begin to describe this is as with all the transfers in this set these need to be seen to be believed mere screen caps are not going to convey the full experience if you have ever seen uh, bruce lee's filmography before you have never seen them like this these are revelatory in every way it's just that fist of fury does have the most artifacts baked into the original negative scan now in terms of the audio all of the audio has been uh, also 
also from new restorations, just like the big boss. They are all dramatic improvements, particularly the original Mandarin mono track. Uh, but we have for the primary feature, we have the Mandarin mono, we have the Cantonese reissue mono, and we have the English mono dub track. Uh, now, I watched the film with the Mandarin track and then sampled the other tracks. Uh, but in particular, probably just like the big boss, uh, both the big boss and Fist of Fury probably have the biggest upgrades in audio because on the Criterion box set, for example, uh, the audio for the Mandarin track of, of Fist of Fury had a lot of hum in it and just didn't sound very good and, you know, also sounded like it had been, you know, EQ'd and manipulated some and with some noise reduction, but it, it definitely had an audible hum that went throughout the whole feature. All of that is gone here, and the audio sounds dramatically improved, just like the picture. So again, for audio, I think the biggest improvements are for both the Big Boss and especially here on Fist of Fury. So I think the audio is a dramatic improvement. Uh, we thankfully get the uh, primary alternate dubs of the film, so you can view the film uh, however you wish, in the original Mandarin, in the English dub, or in the Cantonese dub. Now, unfortunately, while there are, again, some alternate cuts of the film presented with all alternate audio options, but unfortunately here uh, it was credited uh, that this disc would include the Japanese mix of the film, or I should say the, the Japanese mix of, the, uh, of a particular English dub, but unfortunately that was not able to be included, so if you're looking for the Japanese option, it's listed on the credits, but it, it couldn't be included unfortunately, so it's not actually on the disc, and that did cause some confusion and discussion, but uh, Arrow did actually respond about that. So um, don't keep looking for a Japanese audio option because it, it, it simply isn't there, but it is still listed on the back of the uh, special features credits. But um, that's why you're not going to find that on the disc. Now we have the Digipack itself with beautiful, unique artwork featuring Fist of Fury images, but matching with the overall uh, package box set design have the lovely simple matching spine, the interior with beautiful original poster artwork, matching disc label, and then a lovely usage of the wonderful English Fist of Fury logo. And then here's the rear with the extensive supplements listed. So here we have the 4K presentation in Dolby Vision, HDR10 compatible, uh, restored by Arrow from the original camera negative. Uh, then we have the alternate English export cut viewing option with different opening and closing credits via seamless branching, which of course once again means that they had to actually go in and conform the new 4K master to recreate the alternate cut presentation. And then we have the newly restored audio tracks, the original Mandarin mono, the English dub mono, and the Cantonese dub mono tracks. Now, this is uh, then when it credits the two English mono options, the standard mix and a Japanese mix with alternate music. But that's where we go into, as I mentioned before, unfortunately, Arrow couldn't include the, the uh, Japanese version. So that is unfortunately not on the disc, but still listed here. So again, uh, don't, don't get super confused if you're looking for that on the disc. Unfortunately, it is not there. We again have newly translated English subtitles plus optional subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing on the English dubs. Uh, then we again have two brand new commentaries. Uh, the first is by Jonathan Clements and again is a beautiful, wonderful, well done new commentary track that is then followed by another Brandon Bentley track, which as I mentioned on the Big Boss, his track is a little bit more energetic and it's a fun balance having the two. And once again, they don't uh, cover the same information. They complement each other well. That's a very hard thing to do with two different people or entities doing two different audio commentaries for the same film on the same disc release. So having two excellent commentaries brand new for this release that cover new ground and don't simply repeat previous commentaries from older releases and don't repeat the same information as the other track on the same disc that that managed to so they basically managed to complement each other is a very hard thing to do it's something you rarely see and another sign that you know everybody put in the extra effort and again i love listening to the first track and then getting to the more energetic brandon bentley track to sort of have a a little bit more fun because if you had two commentary tracks that were done in the sort of standard straightforward way it 
might get a little bit dry, especially if you listen to the two commentaries in close proximity or one after the other. And that's not to say that Clemens's track is is dull or doesn't or, or not energetic. It's still a great listen, but it's it's great to have the the going into the then second track to be just a little bit more energetic and a little bit more. Hey, look at this and isn't this interesting? And uh, you know, it it keeps your your interest going to then be in the second commentary and for it to have just a little bit more energy because not everybody is going to sit down and listen to two different commentaries on, on the same disc. But of course, I'm a commentary geek and I make my own commentary. So of course, I'm going to geek out over the commentaries. Then we have Legend of the Dragon, which is a brand new, exhaustive, 82-minute documentary by Tony Raines on uh, basically an entire life and career overview of Bruce Lee. Uh, it is exceptionally well done, well-researched, very conversational, easy to pick up for newcomers, and I think the best overall piece I've ever seen on Lee's life and career. Um, it's better than the you know so-called official documentaries for sure, and is done with such a, a, a degree of respect and uh, trying to get all details uh, you know out there, of particularly about Lee's early career and his early films as a child actor in Hong Kong. It's something that you rarely see uh, gone over, and there's also somebody who's seen a lot of those films and a lot of very difficult to see films. So this is somebody with years of experience just uh, studying Lee's career. So uh, again, this is a 82 minute documentary that is worth your time uh, and one of the best supplements in this entire set. Then we get Visions of Fury, which is specifically about Bruce Lee working at Golden Harvest with Lo Wei as well, and talking about the whole dynamic of how uh, Lee signed a contract for two films and became a star on The Big Boss and how that uh, changed the sort of environment going into Fist Fury and how he and Lo Wei kept butting heads and eventually had a falling out and how uh, Lee navigated his career at Golden Harvest with Raymond Chow and things. So it's great getting additional detail and insight into the the actual production and more of the business and contract side of things and the, the personal uh, interactions between everybody involved. And also we have first-hand interviews with, of course, people who were there at Golden Harvest at the time, which is, of course, fascinating and wonderful to get their perspectives, to get that first-hand quality. Then we get the new video essay by Brandon Bentley entitled New Fist Part 2 Fist, which is about comparing the two different quasi-sequels made to Fist of Fury by two completely different entities that really go completely different pathways and feature original cast members returning, and one of them was actually directed again by Lo Wei. So um, it's, it's kind of an odd example of a film years later getting two completely different quasi-sequels made, and it's fascinating to compare the two. Um, Arrow has actually just released a, a, a lovely Blu-ray edition of one of those, so you can actually check out New Fist of Fury on the Arrow Blu-ray. And, and this extra is also included on there, but it's great to have it here as well to explain the, the sort of follow-ups in greater context. And we get several archive interviews ported over from previous releases, some of which, if not most of these, were on the Shout and Criterion box sets. Then we get an alternate credit sequence for one of the alternate versions of the film. Uh, it is upscaled standard def, but amazing to have that included as well. We then get an extensive trailer gallery which is mostly done from standard of upscales again. However, the U.S. trailer is a newer HD scan, which is nice to see. But then also we get the inclusion of an, what's credited as a trailer reel of various Chen Zen films done in the aftermath of Fist of Fury's popularity. So you get to see how the legendary story has been handled in many different film adaptations and television adaptations over the years to varying degrees and they all seem to stem from the iteration here in Fist of Fury that's you know apparently you know obviously become more iconic than the actual you know story in history was uh, how it actually apparently went down uh, 
uh, versus the dramatization scene in Fist of Fury. And it's a quite extensive gallery too, so you get to see all kinds of different iterations of how Fist of Fury has influenced other people to basically try and do their own version or story with the Chen Zen character in some form. We even get an original UK radio spot for the British release of Fist of Fury, which is fascinating to be able to listen to. And then we get another extensive image gallery for Fist of Fury in particular. So that is the presentation and handling of Fist of Fury on the third disc and the set. Then we come to disc four, which is devoted to the UHD presentation of The Way of the Dragon. This is a wonderful new 4K scan and restoration, but as I alluded to before, unfortunately, it seems the original camera negative is lost or no longer around, so they had to go to an inner positive, which is the best thing that Fortune Star had in the vault. So in a technical way, this is obviously not going to match the uh, scans and presentations of Big Boss and Fist of Fury, which were coming from the original negative. And this also goes for Game of Death, the 1978 theatrical release film as well. So of the 4K uh, presentations, uh, it is obviously going to be the Big Boss and Fist of Fury that look the best and have the best technical quality because those are the two coming from the original camera negatives. It should also be noted that The Way of the Dragon was photographed and essentially in technoscope because that was what the cinematographer was really interested in and Bruce Lee was also himself impressed by what technoscope could do. So that means that obviously you have the inherent uh, issues and quirks of technoscope being a two-perf format that would then be converted to a traditional four-perf scope print but allowing you to use spherical lenses and get really tight close-ups in the same manner that Sergio Leone had developed and was the most famous uh, person using technoscope for its visuals. But, of course, you also could not do things that a traditional scope film would do, and it is not an anamorphic film, so that it will always cause it to look a little bit different. And due to the fact that the film was also shot in Rome for the, for the particular sequences in a very sort of shoestring rushed manner there are a number of out of focus shots or soft shots scattered throughout particularly in the airport opening those are still here of course because all of that is just intrinsic to the original production and that is intrinsic to the film itself so there's obviously nothing you can do about that and it was simply due to how they had to shoot the material and with the time and uh, budget and production constraints they had so unfortunately there are the the handful of soft or out of focus shots scattered throughout but uh, that's just how the film has always been because that's how it was produced now all of that out of the way this is again easily the best you will ever see the way of the dragon or the best it has been presented to this point the level of detail compared to what we've seen before is revelatory and allows you to further see that we had a different cinematographer a different visual style and uh, it, you know that it was actually technoscope, it does look physically different to the previous two films that were shot in some form of scope in anamorphic. So it's obviously not the same visual style and visual type of film due to it being a different format, but seeing it this way done to the best quality that is humanly possible, even though they're having to use an inner positive, it's quite stunning actually and you don't have any of the awful color timing problems of the previous HD presentation. So once again, this is a slam dunk, astonishing upgrade visually. You just have to keep in mind the uh, production limitations and the fact that it's a different film format, a different cinematographer, and unfortunately they were not able to use the original negative, which apparently no longer survives. So this is coming from an inner positive. So it has been done to the same great quality level uh, in in terms of the work that's been done in the 4k scan but the source is a little bit more limited now you are going to see a few little original artifacts pop up or try to creep in a little bit uh, there is you know an occasional very tiny speck scattered throughout there are one or two moments where you see a little bit of a, of a line trying to start to come through or be in a small spot 
But again, that, that all is inherent to the original source they were working from, which here is the inner positive, is the best surviving element. And they were very much trying to restore these films as best as possible, but also stay out of the way and not get too crazy in trying to erase any sort of physical artifacts. Because a lot of these, you know, there's not necessarily a lot you can do with them and then go in there and try to eradicate everything means you're probably going to obviously overstep the boundary and and do what unfortunately a lot of other thing uh, masters do and yet being a bit too overzealous with the cleanup so uh, these these are not going to ever be 100 percent pristine because this is obviously trying to be a much more archival style of presentation but you will need to expect to see scattered throughout some very minor original artifacts poking in here and there and most of this stuff is is so minor and so well handled that most people are not going to notice or spot these things, but due to the fact that we are looking at these in 4K resolution with HDR grades and everything is so beautifully handled, uh, it's it's a bit easier to to notice when you see a little tiny you know bit of a line creeping in here and there. But it's it's all inherent to the original source, and I would much rather uh, have somebody doing the best that they can and not going too far and and messing with the image to try and eradicate every last little uh, physical element bit that's from the original source. You know, I'd much rather have you know a, a few little bits here and there poking in or, or barely visible and have a natural appearance overall in an archival style than somebody going to town and going crazy with uh, DNR and other um, elements of the, the uh, visual toolbox to try and eradicate everything. The HDR grading here is again in Dolby Vision, which is how I watched the film. They also did a separate grade in HDR10 and SDR. I did look at the other grades, and again, I think the Dolby Vision does uh, dramatically enhance and improve the master compared to what's on the HDR10 presentation, but it's you know usually in very subtle areas or it's just able to be much more detailed. But for those who don't have Dolby Vision capability, the HDR10 grading is still really well done and nothing really seems overdone or, or, or too bright. It's all very, very tasteful and very well done and nicely enhances the overall new master. But you know, you're you're obviously never going to get over the fact that this was a different format, it's a different shoot, it's a different looking film, and they're not able to use the original negative, so obviously it technically uh, looks a little bit lesser compared to the first two films, but that's simply due to the fact that they're not able to use the original negative, and it's a different looking film anyway. Another note I'd like to point out, uh, when you're watching one of the, uh, or particularly with the Mandarin original audio, and you've got the English subtitles on, I did notice that, especially in HDR with or in Dolby Vision, that the subtitles at times would have a little bit of, of noise or aliasing in them that's very minor, but uh, since we're now in 4K and I'm watching this on an OLED, um, I, I usually have to turn down the, the brightness on my uh, for the subtitles on my Panasonic 820 player because it seems to want to make it as bright as the image. Uh, so I don't know if this is more of a, of a player and HDR issue, but I did notice there was some noise in the actual subtitle text. Um, it wasn't really there as much in HDR 10, so it might just be a Dolby Vision and, and player thing, but I did notice it more here in Way of the Dragon than I did in the other films, but there was some degree of it in the actual subtitle font and text of, of all of the uh, films on UHD. But again, that might just be something that's aggravated or enhanced by my Panasonic 820 and my Sony OLED. And I, I noticed this at times on, on certain UHDs and things, but um, it, it didn't seem as prevalent on the HDR10. So again, it, it might just be a, a player and Dolby Vision thing, but I did want to mention that because I did notice it. Again, we had a new audio restoration and the film comes with its three primary audio tracks, the original Mandarin mono, the English dub mono, and the Cantonese dub mono. I watched the film in Mandarin and then sampled the other tracks, and all three of them did seem to be improved over what was on the Criterion box set. So again, the audio here is a big improvement and presented in lossless quality for all three tracks. There's also an alternate cut, uh, an alternate Japanese cut with its own unique English mono track as well, which also has a unique end title song so that's another unique audio track for a different cut of the film but the primary version 
the 4K Master has the regular standard three audio tracks. And for newcomers, I always recommend just sticking with the original Mandarin track with English subtitles. We have the beautiful artwork, which matches the rest of the box set and looks fantastic. The custom matching spine, the interior with lovely original poster art and matching disc label and then beautiful original key poster artwork. And then we have the rear with the extensive list of the supplemental features. To go over these, we have the 4K UHD presentation in Dolby Vision and also with the HDR10 grading. And of course, the film is also graded in SDR as well. Newly restored by Arrow from original elements of both the Hong Kong theatrical cut and the alternate Japanese cut via seamless branching. And again, the, this was coming from the best surviving element, which was the original interpositive instead of the original negative, which is unfortunately gone. Uh, we have the newly restored lossless Mandarin, English, and Cantonese mono tracks for the theatrical cut, and then an alternate English mono track for the Japanese cut, which again has unique music as well, uh, and then also is you know obviously just a different version of or a different English mono track for the Japanese market in particular. And again, to create this, they actually had to go in and conform the 4K master of the theatrical cut to the Japanese cut and do that by hand so once again my hats off to them for taking that extra effort there are also newly translated english subtitles subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing on both english audio tracks uh, we have two new commentaries again the first is a lovely uh, commentary with frank jing and michael worth uh, it's a wonderful discussion of the film they get into the nuance of the production and it's a nice lively back and forth between the two who have a wealth of information about the the various cast and crew the overall production the shooting in rome uh, what Lee was trying to do with the film and so much to to go over that you really do need a second commentary, which has Brandon Bentley return with his wonderful energetic style. And it's a great compliment to the first commentary once again. So you have two excellent must listen commentaries that cover new ground and are unique. So they don't overlap and they complement each other. So once again, my hat's off to everybody for actually coming up with two brand new commentaries that find new information and new ground to cover and don't overlap so you're not hearing a lot of the same stories and anecdotes over and over again. So that's a very difficult thing to do, and it's really appreciated when people take the time to not only make a good commentary track, but they also try to make sure they don't cover the same material that a lot of people might have already covered or is covered in the other track on the same disc. We get a new documentary entitled The Way of the Camera, which is in particular about uh, Lee's filmmaking style and his fighting methodology in particular in regards to how it is handled and utilized here in The Way of the Dragon, which of course was also Lee's directorial debut. He not only starred in the film, he directed it and also wrote it. But this is where we get into the best discussion and the most detail about the unique visual style of the film, having a different cinematographer who pushed to use technoscope instead of anamorphic, uh, how the room location shoot went and how the overall quality of that was limited due to the, the very rush sort of guerrilla style of having to just go in there and get the footage really fast. And that's why we have some out of focus shots and different things and some very wobbly handheld bits. Uh, but it's it's honestly it goes into a, a you know, a, a, the, the scope of this documentary is a little bit bigger than that because there is some more discussion and background on not just Lee's uh, martial arts philosophy, but also his working relationship at Golden Harvest with Raymond Chow and all the Golden Harvest staff, and how in particular this, this was for Way of the Dragon, which was also the unique film because it was done in conjunction with Lee's new production company, Concord, which was to be Bruce Lee's production company and was the company in charge technically of making The Way of the Dragon. So this wasn't only a Bruce Lee film in terms of him actually making it and being in control of it. It was also being handled by his production company. So this was sort of new unprecedented territory for a studio in Hong Kong to give the star of the film not only full creative control but his own production company in charge of the film that was linked to Golden Harvest so uh, this is an essential piece and uh, again 
quite extensive and quite long and really well done, so you just want to watch it all in one sitting. But the, the scope of it is even a little bit bigger than just focusing on Way of the Dragon in those particular aspects. We get a nice new interview entitled Meet the Italian Beauty, which is Melissa Lungo, who is the... Uh, I guess technically has a sort of bit part in the film as the uh, the woman who comes up and, and takes uh, Bruce's character back to her boudoir and uh, then disrobes, much to his <laughs> amazement. Uh, but this is a nice, lengthy interview. She is a wonderful interviewee with a, a, a great sense of spirit and humor, even all these years later. And, and she talks about the film and, and her experience on, in making it and also her overall career trajectory and um, it's another wonderful interview that you know goes on for for quite some length that's not just a little you know talking head bit you actually get a sense of the interviewee and uh, she seems actually interested in, in talking which is great because not every person years later or decades later has you know the, the a lot of things to go over particularly for such a small part but uh, it apparently was was a particular moment in, in her career so she's able to go into great detail about it so it's a wonderful interview so it, it's it's uh, again really really rewarding even though it's just somebody who was only in the film for for that one particular little little short scene she's able to give a lot of great context about what it was like to be on the set of the film and interacting with Bruce Lee and everyone else so it's really Really rewarding. Similarly, we get The Scottish Soldier Meets the Dragon, which is uh, an interview with John Young, who was an on-set observer, actually got to go on set and meet Bruce Lee and everyone, and was also a martial artist himself. So he has great insight into what it was like to literally be there on the set when they were staging and filming one of the fight sequences, and also you know, having that perspective of someone who was also into martial arts themselves. It gives you that wonderful sort of time capsule feel of what it must have been like to actually be on the set of Way of the Dragon. We get a newly recorded uh, select scene commentary by Piet Sweer, who plays one of the thugs in the film, and of course is involved in many of the fight sequences. So we get, again, first-hand perspective, but now from someone who was on the other side, <laughs> receiving some of uh, Lee's punches and kicks, and what it, what it was like to actually be in the fight sequences. So that's fascinating. We again get some of the archive interviews Interviews that are the legacy extras from previous releases, so we get a whole gallery of those. Uh, we also get another trailer gallery, which is quite extensive. Most of them are, are pretty much all standard def, so they are being upscaled. However, there are some alternate titles that are presented, which are HD scans. It's pretty much the English uh, export title sequence has has HD uh, is an HD scan, but everything else is still a standard def upgrade. But it's wonderful getting to see all the different trailers and see how the film was sold and marketed over time in different territories. We also get an entire trailer reel of Bruce exploitation films, so you get to see a variety of wild, wacky, amusing, crazy uh, different attempts at exploiting the sort of gaping hole in the Hong Kong film industry that was left when uh, Bruce Lee passed away. And it's it's wonderful for someone like myself included who hasn't had a lot of experience with Bruce Ploitation and just sort of marvels at the insane ideas and things they came up with and expected people to just go and purchase a ticket for. So it's fascinating to get to see a whole trailer reel essentially of different Bruce exploitation films and we also get another extensive image gallery for The Way of the Dragon. This is an incredible presentation of what is really I mean it's truly the one complete true honest Bruce Lee film experience. It's the one film he had full creative control over. It's the film where you can most feel him as a developing artist if you will. It's the one that even people who knew him said had the most of his personality. It's also the film where he smiles the most. It's the film that has a sense of humor that is most obvious. It was obviously designed for the Hong Kong market, but it's it's the one that has the most genuine warmth to it. It has the greatest heart, and I think it is 
clearly the 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 best overall Bruce Lee film experienced. No, it's not technically as polished as say Fist of Fury, but it doesn't have any of the old style of filmmaking that Bruce Lee was so actively fighting against. This is the one time where he got to truly express himself in a completed film, which is why it is truly priceless and of his entire completed filmography it is you know the 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 sort of jewel in the crown if you will because it's the one film where he truly got to express himself and it is the one uh, concord film and fascinatingly arrow has actually included the original concord films logo that actually represents Bruce Lee's philosophy in the actual logo design and how it plays out with using the yin and yang symbol. And I had not really seen it before in in that level of quality. I'd seen images of it, but it was incredible to see that here on the 4K master presentation. So when you put this in and it starts, you'll get Golden Harvest, but then you get the all-important Concord Films logo and this was the only time it was ever used because this is the only Concord film. So I just thought that was a real fitting uh, tribute to uh, Lee's career and, and what he was striving so hard to achieve with his films. So that's why I wanted to underline that fact and, and just how important that is to have the original Concord logo at the start of The Way of the Dragon. Now we move on to the next disc, which of course covers Enter the Dragon. Uh, as you can tell, though, this is already a bit different looking because it uses the original poster artwork. Now, unfortunately, while Warner Brothers has completed their 4K scan and restoration for UHD release, it was uh, deemed uh, not uh, accessible for Arrow to use. They did try to license the film from Warner Brothers, but they were not allowed to use or work on the new 4K master. So that remains a Warner Brothers standalone release. And Arrow was at least able to include the 2013 UK Blu-ray of Enter the Dragon, which was the 40th anniversary disc with a bunch of new extras, plus all of the old legacy Warner Brothers extras for the most part. So unfortunately, this is kind of a placeholder disc for uh, an Arrow UHD that just wasn't allowed to be. Thankfully, Arrow was able to have some physical version of Enter the Dragon, so the box set did have Bruce Lee's entire completed filmography. But again, it is simply the 2013 Enter the Dragon Warner disc from the UK, which is pretty much the same as what we had in the U.S. It's still an okay presentation of the film, but it does not have the original mono mix of the film, which was finally restored for Criterion's box set and is carried over to the Warner UHD. Uh, the Warner and Criterion presentations also have both cuts of the film, the theatrical version, and the longer so-called special edition cut of the film, whereas the 2013 disc merely has the special edition cut with the 5.1 remix, which is revisionist and does not include the original mono track, which is the much better listen. So this is nice that they could include it, but I really only talk about it as a sort of footnote and unfortunately can only think about the what could have been because I have reviewed Warner's standalone UHD and while the new scan and master are beautiful, it has been handled quite poorly by Warner Brothers who only put out this bare bones release in the US with uninspired cover artwork really crummy encoding in spots, uh, but thankfully it is the best the film has ever looked and does include both cuts with the original mono mix and Bruce Lee's original voice recordings for the mono track of the extended cut, which is why that's so important to look at the mono track on the extended cut of the film. However, the Warner presentation drops all of the legacy extras except the commentary and introduction. It has no additional disc, whereas the British release includes the 2013 Blu-ray. So uh, basically you have to pick up the Warner UHD to have the best looking version of Enter the Dragon with both cuts with the all important original mono track but if you have the arrow box you have the 2013 warner blu-ray included which has all of the legacy extras from that release and most of the extras from warner's other dvds and blu-rays so basically you have the second disc in the arrow set that is on the uk version of warner's uhd which has the same uhd disc but did include the 2013 blu-ray so 
this is how you basically have all the Warner supplements uh, because the Aero set does include the 2013 disc. But basically, you have to then switch over to the bare bones, disappointing Warner UHD and kind of cry a little bit thinking about what Arrow would have done with uh, Enter the Dragon and what extras they would have come up with. And of course, they would have given the film a Dolby Vision HDR grading and maxed out the bit rate and would have had the same quality level of presentation as the other UHDs in their set, which have been handled to the best possible degree. And so all of Bruce Lee's films outside of Enter the Dragon now actually technically look better on physical media than Enter the Dragon does, which was the only one that was an American production co-financed by Warner Brothers and had more money in the production. So technically it should look better than the Golden Harvest films, but due to the way Warner Brothers handled the UHD with subpar encoding and a bare bones cutting all corners nature, all you can do is switch to the Warner UHD, watch the beautiful new master with all the compromises, and just think about what could have been had Arrow been allowed to actually handle this same exact master. It should also be stressed that the Warner UHD only has HDR10. They do not do Dolby Vision grades, so that's another uh, negative and loss at what could have been on an Aero UHD version of the same exact master. I don't think it needs to be stressed enough that this is a perfect example of the difference between a group and releasing entity that does not care about the final release product and a group and releasing entity that does. This is not simply a studio versus boutique argument. This is simply someone who doesn't care and someone who does care. It's as simple as that, and this is a perfect example of how this can manifest itself in a physical media release. So here, of course, we have the two releases, and Arrow has beautifully used the iconic original poster artwork, and Warner has made this horrible generic Photoshop job that just looks terrible. Um, But this is basically what you have to do. You have to have the If you have the U.S. version, which just has the UHD, you switch over to, if you're watching the films in chronological order, you switch over to watching the Warner UHD and, you know, with its uh, encoding problems and such. uh, And then you pop in the 2013 Blu-ray here on included on the Arrow release to then look at all of the extras that Warner Brothers here in the U.S. thought were not important to include in their UHD. So Arrow has lovingly reproduced the original poster artwork on a matching digipack. It looks and wonderful uh, in terms of the printing. We have a matching spine for the rest of the box, but here there is actually a little WB logo because, of course, this is a Warner Brothers film. They produced a matching interior with original Hong Kong poster artwork. Then, of course, we have the UK 2013 Blu-ray with the UK rating logo. So this is, of course, what you have in the standard 2013 Warner UK Blu-ray. It's the same exact disc. And then there's just a plain white backing underneath it. So that's why this is a little bit different looking, obviously, uh, when compared to everything else in the box set, because this is the one disc where they literally just had that were only able to include the 2013 Warner Blu-ray. The rear matches with the rest of the set and includes the supplemental features list from the Warner release. So this is the uh, the extras found on the 2013 disc, which are actually quite substantial and include most of the previous extras from other Warner releases. To briefly go over these, it's the 40th anniversary 2013 Blu-ray from Warner uh, with a 1080p presentation of the extended cut of the film. Uh, It only features the 5.1 remix, which was done in 1998, which is you know relatively okay but it does make some music errors and it is completely revisionist and sounds nowhere near as good as the original mono audio mix uh, so it's unfortunate that for the longest time the film could only be heard with the remix which is not as good as the original track and that original mono is not here because this is the 2013 disc it does have the feature commentary by the writer and producer which is a solid track but unfortunately a little bit dry um, unfortunately Unfortunately, Warner did not make any new extras for the 50th anniversary, so uh, this is really all you have in terms of the extras are only on the previous Warner disc. We have the newer featurettes that were made for the 2013 release, which are 
quite substantial in terms of the runtime, uh, much more than usual Warner discs, but uh, they, they also are their primary focus more on Bruce Lee's overall career and his martial arts philosophy. But there are quite a number of them, and it's great to have them in some form since Warner in the U.S. thought that no one needed any of the legacy extras because they don't think extras are important because they're Warner. This also includes even the wonderful backyard home footage of Bruce Lee training, uh, in addition to the Curse of the Dragon documentary and the uh, actual making of Enter the Dragon piece. Uh, there's interviews with Bruce Lee's widow and then uh, a 1973 featurette about the making of the film, which is the original studio promo piece, in addition to some of the trailers and TV spots. But this is, again, the same extras package as the 2013 disc because this is literally the 2013 disc reprinted. Now we turn to the 1978 theatrical Game of Death release, which was directed by Robert Klaus and is the film that Golden Harvest put together years later to try and utilize some of Bruce Lee's actual footage that he shot for his Game of Death. But rather infamously, they kind of just tacked that on at the end in a, in a short edited bit of uh, Lee's footage and all of the raw takes he had shot, and then constructed an entirely new film around it, which honestly, for that period in time, is probably the only way they could have gone outside of maybe just uh, making a longer edit of the footage and presenting it with a documentary or something. But, uh, you know, there, there were ways they could have gone about uh, making a newer story. And honestly, some of the ideas and concepts are not terribly bad or you know they, they at least make sense but it's the overall execution and the fact that the actual script is not the greatest in the world that really holds this film back and for me it's it's certain aspects of the production being a little bit later in the decade and being a bit spiffed up and it, it, that that help it along a little bit along with some of the fight sequences being pretty good and the fact that you have more uh, American cast and uh, at least some sense of an American co-financing deal or distribution deal, I should say, because this was not like Enter the Dragon where it had a lot of American money in it. It was more of a Golden Harvest film that had some sort of distribution connection with Columbia Pictures, actually, who put it out here in the U.S. But the, the single greatest aspect of this film is the score by John Barry. It's Barry's score that drives the film. Film. It's Barry's score that gives it life. That is the one thing that truly lives up to Bruce Lee's legend, if you will. And Barry is one of the people who should have scored a, a Bruce Lee film. So it's absolutely fitting that he does the score here. And since previous films had actually lifted some of his scores, particularly for Diamonds Are Forever, I think pops up in Way of the Dragon, as most Hong Kong films would pilfer regularly from other scores, which one of the uh, booklet essays goes into, and so do some of the commentary tracks. But in any case, uh, the whole scenario of Game of Death remains fascinating. It remains a sort of curio. It's, it's very much a... I mean, it, it's very unique that you have a studio with all this footage from an incomplete film from a legendary star who died too young and then decided to cobble it get together an entirely new film surrounding only an edited chunk of said footage and gave it to the director of Enter the Dragon, who famously clashed with Bruce Lee and was not necessarily the correct person to then interpret what Lee was trying to do in a film that was you know, really trying to be a cinematic expression of his martial arts and life philosophy. So it's it's been distilled so much and reduced so much that you only get the bare minimum of that when we get to the end of the film, when we finally get to a very short, I think it's, you know, 10 to 15 minute edit of the footage that he shot. And it was just amazing to get even that, that, you know, you, you can't help the fact that the film proceeds along and you know, manages to be better than you think it might be, except for the extremely poor taste shown and reusing uh, footage of Bruce Lee from the other films throughout and and then at it at the absolute worst using the you know the the sort of optical with the cut out of Lee's face and and then worst of all showing actual footage of his funeral in the feature film, uh, which was just an appalling lack of taste. But it's when you get to that footage when Bruce himself actually shows up and you see just that, that short little edit of actual 
the game of death footage and the you know lee in the yellow tracksuit probably being the most iconic image we have of lee that hey, even people who've never seen any of these films know very well you know it, it very much helped to further cement the legend even though we're now in 1978 at the tail end of the decade and several years have passed with nothing but bruce Bloitation films so it's it's a uh, to say it's a cinematic oddball is an understatement it does not sit well with everyone but you know the the lapses in taste aside it's actually i think better than it could have been but it still remains a complete cinematic oddball that never quite fully gels or works uh, simply due to how it was written conceived and executed but to have it here in the arrow set is a must because it is part of Lee's filmography, even though he probably would not have obviously liked the end result. You know, you do have have it as part of the sort of initial 1970s footnote in Lee's filmography. And it was the first time anybody saw some of the Game of Death footage itself. But again, the 1978 Game of Death film should never be confused as an actual Bruce Lee film, which it is not. And it's very clearly obvious when they're shoehorning in whatever bit of footage they can. But again, it uh, you know aside from uh, some of the cast and some of the fight sequences, the two great aspects are seeing some of Bruce Lee's actual Game of Death footage, and John Barry's score is the thing that actually makes the film move and have a sense of substance to it. Uh, Game of Death has also been uh, restored in this 4K master, but like The Way of the Dragon, they did not have the original negative to work from. This was taken from the CRI Internet negative, which is the best source that anyone has in a vault or is, uh, or the best source that's known to exist. So once again, it's not going to hit the same quality standards as The Big Boss and uh, Fist of Fury, simply because they're not working from the negative. However, that being said, this is again the best I have ever seen this film look, and the best that I think anyone has seen this film look, short of maybe seeing in a brand new print uh, back before, or as soon as the film came out in 1978. But even then, I don't think it was done to the same quality standard as this 4K master was. Now, due to the nature of this film and constantly shoehorning in footage from Lee's actual previous films, the actual quality overall is always going to vary. There are many moments that are obviously duped in or copied straight from The Big Boss or Fist of Fury or Way of the Dragon, and of course not really Enter the Dragon because that was Warner, so it's primarily the first three films, and they are shamelessly peppered throughout, along with close-ups and stills, and uh, also, you know, footage from not only the previous films, but the unbelievably tactless decision to include footage of Bruce Lee's actual funeral, which was shot and photographed uh, for, by Golden Harvest and shown in their documentary around the same time. So overall, you're always going to have that variation in the film. The actual newly shot material does look better because it was the actual, uh, you know, a new material in 1978. But you're always going to have that sort of patchwork quality due to how this film was cobbled together and designed to use as many random shots or any outtakes they could find of Bruce as possible. So that's just the, the nature of the 1978 Game of Death. Now, in spite of coming from a CRI, this looks really exceptional and, again, has none of the horrible color timing problems of the previous Fortune Star Masters that you saw on the Shout releases or on the Criterion box set. So, again, there are no color problems here, but because they're coming from a CRI and not the original negative, it's just not hitting that same technical level of quality as, as it would have if it was the original negative they were having to work with. Now, in terms of the overall HDR and the uh, appearance of the film, we again have a Dolby Vision grade, also with an HDR10 and SDR grade as well. Uh, the Dolby Vision does enhance the overall visuals and give you greater nuance throughout. But this is never going to be the most visually striking film. It was not really designed for that. <laughs> and, and visually, in terms of the composition, I think, is a significant downgrade from all of Lee's actual films, and I don't think anybody's going to mistake this for an actual Bruce Lee film, just seeing the actual photography and composition. Um, you can de definitely tell this is the the uh, the same director as Enter the Dragon, which I think also it has shows a marked difference from uh, Lee's uh, main Golden Harvest films. But, you know, it, it very much looks about as good as I think it possibly can. There is uh, what some people might label 
possible, maybe a little bit of black crush in certain areas. But I think part of that is just due to the actual original photography. I think some of that is inherent because I kind of got that impression even looking at the Criterion Blu-ray with the terrible Fortune Star color grade on it. I should say Rich Ravada color grade on it. Uh, so here I think it plays much better because you don't have the awful color grading. But I think some of that darkness is just due to how the film was shot. And I don't think it's as polished in, in visual terms. And I don't think it's as visually impressive as the films that preceded it simply due to how it was made. Uh, again, I think the HDR does help. I think it manages to open up some of the visuals a little bit and this you know manages to have a re quite remarkable appearance and i can't stress enough how much of an improvement it is to not have the terrible color grading on this because that does really detract from the experience and here you get to see a lovely new 4k master done as best as humanly possible from this element even though it's a patchwork of having all the clips and dupe footage of the previous film shoved in there and they're working from a cri and not the original negative um, i think this is about as good as it possibly can be uh, again, you are going to see some very, very, very infrequent uh, artifacts pop up in terms of maybe a slight spec or two, and then maybe a tiny little bit of a line trying to creep in along the corner in one or two very minor spots, but all of this seems inherent to the source they were working from. And again, this is striving to be as archivally minded as possible. So again, I would much rather see something like that that is naturally there and has been addressed to as best a possible a level without actually going in and messing with the image. Uh, so I think the HDR is well done. I think it is very tasteful and it is good in both HDR 10 and Dolby Vision. But again, the Dolby Vision uh, grading does uh, enhance things to a better degree than the HDR 10. And if you compare them, I think you will notice the difference that the Dolby Vision is the uh, superior of the two. It should also be stressed that because uh, the film is a bit of a patchwork, the grain structure is going to differ greatly. So uh, the 1978 footage looks a certain way the duped footage from the previous films looks a certain way and looks degraded because they literally just copied it from a various uh, from the various sources at that time and shoved it in there then you have the opticals such as the infamous uh, mirror shot with the <laughs> image of bruce's face merely uh, uh you know sort of optically put over the actor's face and then of course when you get to the actual game of death footage at the end that has a completely different look, color timing and grain structure, and is obviously being slipped in there from the other source. And so none of this stuff matches. And that's always been a part of the 1978 Game of Death and will always be a part of the 1978 Game of Death. So, of course, here it's not only still there, but it's even more apparent because we're looking at a 4K master done to the best possible ability in 2023, which is only going to further accentuate this sort of patchwork quality. Now, the audio is the original English track. This was a film that was pretty much designed with the English track only, but other uh, territories did have some other alternate mixes in addition to the alternate cuts. The English mono has also been newly restored and does sound better than what's on the Criterion box. So again, I think the audio is a significant improvement. And overall, I think the new presentation of the 1978 Game of Death is really striking. And just like all the feature presentations in this set, is pretty much as good as I think is humanly possible uh, with the elements we have and with the UHD format here in 2023, in addition to having the three different gradings for SDR, HDR10, and Dolby Vision. So I don't think anybody could possibly really do better with this film unless uh, the original negative was somehow discovered. That would be uh, the only way that I think you could improve upon this 4K master. Here we have the beautiful case and artwork for the 1978 Game of Death, matching the other uh, digipacks in this set. Also with the same matching label, we have the interior with the original poster artwork and the matching disc label, and then the primary key art of Bruce himself. And then the rear with the blurb about the film and the extensive extras. So to go over the supplements, we have the new 4K transfer on this UHD in Dolby Vision HDR with the HDR10 grade and also done in SDR. 
uh, newly restored by Arrow from the original uh, or best surviving CRI internegative. This is, of course, for the international primary cut of the film. We also have the Japanese cut version uh, reconstructed from this new 4K master. However, some of the unique and alternate footage for the Japanese version had to be sourced from uh, elsewhere. So it's, it's basically a mix of the new 4K International Cut Master, I believe some 2K scans of some Japanese prints. Uh, it, it is, of course, commendable for Arrow to have not only included the Japanese cut, but gone to the effort of reconstructing it from all the best elements possible. We have the newly restored English mono for the International Cut and the newly restored English mono for the Japanese cut, which does have a few differences, but is primarily working off of the restored mono from the International Cut. The Japanese cut is quite important because uh, it's got a slightly different edit of the film, of course. Uh, one of the major fight sequences is a different edit, uh, so it's, of course, important to have as many of the versions preserved as humanly possible. We have English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. We have a brand new feature commentary by Brandon Bitley and Mike Leader, who have a wonderful discussion about the film, jam pack it full of anecdotes and bits of history, notes about the cast and crew, and especially about the construction and why this film is such a patchwork effort. And in spite of itself, it's still rather enjoyable. And especially for those who grew up with it, yeah, there, there's, there's definitely a certain fondness for the 1978 Game of Death, but it should never be mistaken as a true Bruce Lee effort, regardless of how it was, uh, how, how they attempted to sell it over the years but it is an, a unique curio and this is another wonderful exclusive new commentary for the arrow set that is a must listen then we get a really wonderful interview entitled the song i'm singing tomorrow which is an interview with colleen camp like all of these interviews this is a rather lengthy interview where uh, the interviewee actually gets to not only talk about themselves and their career but really convey this sense of what it was like to make this film and, and what they felt their part was in it and how they came to it. So she goes through all of that and, and talks about the experience of, of going to Hong Kong and working at Golden Harvest and what it was like working on the 1978 Game of Death and how the the intent was to try and honor Lee's cinematic legacy, but that it was a unique and rather odd experience. But she has very fond memories of the whole uh, of her whole time there, and apparently loved making the film and loved her experience in Hong Kong. So just like all of the interviews in this set that are that are new, this is a really well done lengthy interview that not only gives you a sense of what the interviewee is like, but really conveys what it was like to make the film, and that, of course, makes the interview all the more rewarding. So this is yet another essential supplement in this film. We also have a little Easter egg that's tucked away on this disc, which is actually a alternate take of Colleen Camp singing uh, the primary song, the song I'll be singing tomorrow, which was written by John Barry, and she actually performs in the film and then is used for the end title. Uh, this this apparently was an alternate version that was only uh, heard on a, I think it was a Japanese television special or something. And so it's just a fascinating inclusion. Again, it is an Easter egg tucked away on here. Uh, but when I found out about it, I was absolutely floored because it's, of course, a John Barry song, and I'm a giant John Barry nerd. He is my favorite composer, and I think his score for this film is absolutely magnificent. But I also really like the song, and I like that it's a... A, a somber John Barry sort of title song and it's not necessarily what you might think of for Game of Death 1978 but it really does work and I think Barry managed to find the, the at least the core themes of this sort of patchwork film and and really build his score around that and again his score is really the glue that holds everything together but it's just a, a fascinating little inclusion and I, I hope more people find out about this easter egg because again it's just not on the actual menu but it's just a wonderful inclusion and an incredibly rare piece because again it was apparently only heard on television one time and uh it's just a really nicely done song and of course i love calling camp in the film even though she doesn't get much to do she's super adorable and uh it's just a, a beautiful, lovely song. Then we get deleted and extended scenes from the Chinese language versions of the film. And this is where we run into the alternate endings. There are three main different endings that are different edits and different presentations 
of some of the same footage and then some go on a bit longer. Now, unfortunately, some of this is in standard definition because that's the only thing anybody can find and nobody's ever found like the actual footage that was shot because in some of the endings that go on longer, we see a conversation uh, with our main characters at the very end, but it's just played out with, uh, with a song as part of a sort of montage. So we never actually get to see them have their final goodbyes and conversation. So that footage has never been found, but we do actually get to see some of those endings with that other footage in addition to the very abrupt uh, alternate ending, which it, which was done for the Chinese market, where uh, the heroes could never quite get away with their actions, as seen in films such as The Big Boss's ending, uh, which had to uh, abide by the uh, Chinese doctrines of the time in terms of uh, the, their, their sort of production code. So we have that alternate ending for the 1978 Game of Death as well. Uh, we also have some other bits of footage in different scenes that were not included in the main international version, including the greenhouse fight, which is a really well done fight sequence that was for various reasons not included in the international cut, but was included in other foreign versions of the film, which didn't have some of the footage from the international cut. And then to make it even more confusing, Golden Harvest actually reused that greenhouse fight in the Game of Death 2 film, uh, because they didn't use it in the international cut of Game of Death that everybody saw in the U.S., so that's why that greenhouse fight is technically in two different films, <laughs> but um, yeah, the, but it's nicely included here. But of course, uh, the international cut and foreign versions of Game of Death 1978 differ in that way, so technically fans might want to someday make a definitive 1978 game of death that also includes the the greenhouse fight and every other little scrap of footage that's unique to the foreign versions. We get some archival interviews with uh, Bob Wall and Dan Inosanto, which have been part of previous releases in terms of physical media, so those have made their way over. Again, these are all pretty much uh, vintage interviews that uh, Arrow has nicely been able to port here. We also get a little bit of behind-the-scenes footage, which was actually actually originally uh, featured in the Bruce Lee the Legend documentary so that's basically been taken out of that and included here so you can see just those uh, behind the scene glimpses of uh, Robert Klaus and others uh, actually shooting various sequences from the film so it's nice to be able to look at that outside of the uh, documentary. We get the uh, pre-production uh, piece from 1976 which was done to promote the film to exhibitors basically, basically and showing everybody in the Golden Harvest offices trying to figure out how to find the next Bruce Lee and it's 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 very I mean, it's very cheesy and gimmicky in that sort of way. And they're basically hyping up, hey, we're finally going to do something with this Game of Death footage, but it's going to be all new, but it's also going to be Bruce Lee footage. But uh, fascinatingly, they've got Andre Morgan, one of the original producers at Golden Harvest, uh, talking with Michael Wirth, and they do a sort of commentary over it. So this is something that apparently is very rare. I had seen like maybe an image from it, but I'd never actually seen it before. So it's fascinating to have that included here and to have the commentary over it as well to give the insight because you actually have one of the guys who was at Golden Harvest, one of their producers, and who is actually, you know, in this this uh, essentially exhibitor um, a promo little short reel. So it's a fascinating inclusion. We get fight scene dailies, which Sammo Hung directed. And of course, Sammo Hung did a lot of the uh, fight choreography for the film. Uh, then we have a locations featurette from 2013, which was on some previous uh, physical media releases that's been ported here. And then we have the trailer gallery, which is quite extensive. Uh, these are all pretty much uh, standard def and upscaled. But uh, we also get yet another Bruce Bloitation trailer reel of basically a gallery of even more Bruce Bloitation films. So you get to see how wacky and crazy they would get. But then there's also an entire section entitled Robert Klaus at Golden Harvest. And these are trailers for other films that Robert Klaus made for the studio. And so you can kind of see where his career kind of came and went around the 1978 game of death so you get even more context about the people behind the camera and once again we get a rather extensive image gallery so that makes up the contents of the uhd for the 1978 theatrical game of death now we move on to the next disc which is entirely devoted to alternate versions of the 1978 game of death 
This is where you run into some of the alternate edits of the film, certain versions of the film having certain sequences that were not in the international cut, changing up the order of scenes a little bit, but then uh, not including scenes that were in the international cut. So it's a bit messy to try and keep all of this straight and to figure out which version has which and which version was done for which market and has what audio track or what audio dub. But very nicely, Arrow has given all of these, uh, or I should say these alternate presentations, their very own separate disc, which also has different audio options and even more extras. Here is the beautiful matching artwork. And rather nicely, they have kept the same key image of Bruce for all of the Game of Death discs, but uh, given it a nice, unique background and front image to make it stand out from the primary Game of Death disc. So I, I like that all of these match, but they all are still their own unique Digipack artwork. We have the lovely spine, labeling this the alternate versions disc. Then we have original poster artwork reproduced with the matching disc label, and then featuring the key art from the US poster artwork, which looks quite fantastic. And then here is the rear, which also gets into the technical details of the cuts on this disc, and also the supplements on this disc. Now, it should be said that this is a Blu-ray, as are pretty much all the other supplemental discs in this set. Uh, you basically have UHDs for the feature films, and then uh, all of the other discs are Blu-ray discs. These are Region B encoded, of course, so you will need a region-free Blu-ray player to be able to play these, as this set is a UK exclusive, and Arrow was not able to get the rights to do a US version, which is why you have to import it. Uh, I wanted to make that distinction because you will run into that if you import this set and you don't have a region-free player. You'll be able to do the UHDs just fine because they're naturally region-free, but all of the Blu-rays are region B locked. So to go over the supplements and the alternate versions and cuts on this disc, uh, we have the HD 1080p Blu-ray presentation of the Chinese version of the film, which has a lossless Mandarin and Cantonese mono audio tracks. We have two audio options with newly translated English subtitles. Uh, then we have a archival interview with Casanova Wong in two, from 2001 uh, on his relationship with Sammo Hung and Bruce Lee's influence. Uh, that's another uh, vintage legacy extra that's been ported over. Uh, we additionally have two alternative Cantonese and Mandarin versions of the film in 1080p, which are seamlessly branched. They have different credits a different ending, and also they reinstate one of the major fight sequences. So um, th th this is really a, a fascinating way to look at the different cuts of the same film that also mix and match what material they keep or retain. So again, there's, there's not yet a definitive Game of Death 1978 that has literally everything. And you also have the multiple different endings of the film that were done for different territories, and none of them are fully satisfied satisfying either because they never they none of them use all the footage that was shot rather confusingly um, but also uh, some of this version had to be sourced from standard def material because apparently that's all that exists so it's a mixture of different masters and again certain portions of it are upscaled standard def because that's simply all that exists but i commend arrow for going the extra mile to include an entire uh, secondary disc just devoted to the alternate cuts of the 1978 Game of Death. The rest of the disc is filled with uh, featurettes and vintage interviews. We have five featurettes, The Hong Kong Connection, Bruce Lee Remembered, Legacy of the Dragon, Dragon Rising, and The Grandmaster and the Dragon. These are featuring interviews with uh, Bruce's friends and co-workers and others in the, in the martial arts realm. And, and some have been on various physical media releases, but it's really nice to see all of these included here. And this is just something I think Arrow did to further be able to fill out this Blu-ray disc. But if that were not enough, we have an entire section of archival interviews themselves that are loaded with anecdotes and stories from 
various other people that uh, worked with Bruce Lee or knew Bruce Lee or who were friends with Bruce Lee or worked on the films. Uh, so, And these run the gamut between both the film world and the martial arts world. And uh, for me, probably my, my favorite of these, of these, and they're all quite lengthy, and they add up to quite a substantial runtime if you were to try and watch all of them in succession. But probably my favorite one is the one with Van Williams because I love the Green Hornet series and that series has never seen an official release and needs one quite badly because it's stuck in Wright's hell. And so any bit of Green Hornet material or interviews or, or Van Williams talking somewhere, I get really excited. So it's really nice seeing him talk for about, you know, 25 to 30 minutes about the show and Bruce Lee and how they became friends and, and giving real personal anecdotes and things. So you get all kinds of stories like that in all of these. So it's really important and wonderful that Arrow was able to port all of these over and include them in the same place. So uh, don't just think this disc is a throwaway because you've got several hours of other featurettes and interviews that are quite important and quite substantial on here in addition to the other versions of the 1978 Game of Death. So uh, even though this is just a Blu-ray disc and it's not a UHD, uh, there's an incredible amount of material on here that is extremely important and fascinating to study to better know the 1978 film and the sort of aftermath of the versions of the 1978 film. Then we come to the next disc in the set, which is devoted to The Final Game of Death, which is an exclusive documentary produced expressly by Arrow Films for this release and is entirely devoted to Bruce Lee's unfinished film, Game of Death, and all of the footage that Lee completed. Additionally, the other missing reels of that footage have been discovered, and so in scanning every single reel of footage that Lee shot, Arrow was able to put together what I think is easily the best documentary about a single film that I have seen since Dangerous Days, the making of Blade Runner back in 2007. This is a 223-minute documentary in eight parts that includes every single take of footage that Lee shot for each of the sequences and manages to lay out the sort of roadmap of Lee's Game of Death how he came up with the idea, uh, basically giving you and an sort of uh, basically a sort of introduction documentary section in part one. And then over the other parts, we have entire parts devoted to what would essentially be one of the entire fight sequences on a single floor of the pagoda. And by going in the actual uh, shooting process, by the actual date and time of which the sequences were shot, we were able to see how Lee built the film and further developed his ideas because he never quite got to finish his concept for the film. So basically he was building and shaping it as it went along and when he could get various people to come in and shoot the actual sequences for the actual floor. Uh, so of course the film was shot out of sequence and never completed so also because the script was not completed and Lee was not quite fully settled on all the aspects of the film, there is still quite a lot of open-ended discussion that can revolve around this film and will always surround this film and always has ever since any scraps of footage or, or any of the idea of what the film is supposed to be even leaked in the 70s. This is a 1080p presentation and basically what was done to give you a sort of idea of what this documentary is like, uh, again, it's nearly four hours and split into eight parts, so you can easily just watch a few sections at a time and, and digest it. Or you can watch all 223 minutes in one go, and it's riveting, and you can do it. It really holds your attention, but of course, we don't really have four hours usually to sit around just to watch a, a documentary in one go, so it's nicely broken up into eight perfect sections. Uh, but what they've done is taken a 2K scan of the raw footage itself, and in each section, we get to see each shot set up and each scene with every single take of footage. So basically, you're seeing every single frame that Bruce Lee shot and able to see 
the takes that work, the takes that had problems, Lee fixing things or tweaking things on set, uh, Lee messing up, Lee laughing at himself, Lee being hard on himself, uh, Lee creating an environment for the other performers and the other actors and the crew. The You get to see bits of the crew moving around. And you see the film starting to move and breathe and, and actually become an entity before your eyes. And what they do with the narration is to give you a documentary approach so you understand the context of what you're seeing and what the intent was and what Bruce Lee's notes were and what the actual script pages were, including some of the dialogue. We actually get the actual dialogue that was supposed to have been spoken and dubbed. We get the actual the actual words that were intended, the actual words that were say, being said and actually written down. But in doing this, you're actually able to have that context and know what's going on and also know at what point in time these sequences were being shot and how they were supposed to fit into the finished hole, even though uh, Lee hadn't quite worked everything out yet and may have come back after Enter the Dragon and maybe tweaked some things or reshot some things or maybe even reshot everything. You know, there, there's there's no telling, but um, it's really vital to have that context, which that no one's really ever got d done to this degree. There have been various documentaries and attempts and reconstructions and things, but no one's ever really gotten the level of context across that's vital to understand what this whole project meant, which was really to be a cinematic expression of Bruce Lee's philosophy and his philosophy of martial art itself. So, but what's fascinating about this, because they're showing you every single take of footage, you can actually start constructing the film in your head, and that's what you do naturally. So this this is why I think this disc really is a film school on a disc. This is a film school and a documentary because you can use this to teach how a film is put together, how it is crafted and built from the ground up, almost like you're you're working on a piece of pottery, and you can make tweaks and changes as you go along. But you know, once you get to a certain point, then you have to actually finalize the process, and so you can see what portions of takes actually worked and where you might want to cut somewhere or you see the the fourth take of something but you realize that the first half of the first take was really good and and maybe you know if you were editing this sequence you might take pieces of each and so when you see a, the the final reconstruction attempt at the end of the documentary you can then sort of compare notes if you will and and then maybe maybe see if uh, maybe you might have chosen something differently so I, I, I think this would make a fact fascinating. Uh, it, it would make a, just an incredible tool to use in a film school environment because not only would you learn everything that you needed to know, but you'd get a sense of not only the hard work that it takes and the hard work that Lee and everyone was putting in, but also how a film can build and evolve during the shooting and then how do you incorporate all that material and how do you edit it and how do you cut it and how do you mix it in terms of actually recording and dubbing sound and doing a sound mix and doing all your effects and things. What's even more amazing about this documentary is that the narration stays out of the way of the footage. It's not just constantly you know, talking for almost four hours. It sets up the historical context. It comes in with the right moments so you know what the uh, wh why the, the, the shot was changed or why they ended at this date, and we go into the next sequence and the next part and things. But it manages to stay out of the way of the actual footage, so it's letting the footage and the material itself tell you the story and only providing the contextual background you need to fully grasp what the footage is telling you uh, but because it was never finished and it has no audio you, you, you don't you, you wouldn't necessarily know that so you need that that narration giving you context but amazingly it manages to stay out of the way of the actual material so this is why it just it 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 just it's hypnotic. It it breathes. The film actually starts to move, and you you gra you totally are on board with it. You can grasp what Lee was after, even though you know he hadn't quite fully worked everything out yet, and he was you know inching closer to that. He was he was finding the film as he went essentially, which 
isn't uh, an approach everybody can pull off, but in certain instances, like like what we have here, uh, it, you, you you can see what he was after. And this this is the first time I think that that has been fully conveyed. There there were some really good attempts before this that gave you the idea and did an edit of of the footage, and and it was it was really good, but. Never before has the idea of what Lee was trying to do really been conveyed in in this sense, to this degree. And then you come to what is the most rewarding part of this. This also includes all the in-between take material. This shows when they stop, when something screws up. And you see them break character. You see the crew guys going around. You see them using the clapper boards to slate everything. And you see the just the drive that Bruce Lee had and the effort he put in and also that he was hard on himself. He was never hard on other people. He's always, you always see him encouraging other people. You see him laughing. You see him just fully invested in what he's doing, but he's hard on himself and you just, you, you get how much effort he was putting into this. And you, you, you literally, with no audio, just in these little glimpses, you, you really feel like you're standing there in the room. And there's Bruce, and he's doing his iconic nunchucks bits. And suddenly something screws up, and he's, you literally just see him just like, oh, man. And you see him just taking it out on himself. And then you see him do it again, and do it again, and do it again, like 5, 10, 12 different times, until he gets it to a point where he feels like it's right. Or if they can't quite get something, they try it over and over and over and over and over again. And then if it's still not quite working, you see him trying to come up with something else, and then suddenly the shot changes. But it's those little in-between moments, those little glimpses that are so human and so vital and you know, I think probably just the the most you'll ever see of Bruce Lee, the person in any of the various materials we've ever seen over the years. Yes, there are some really great interviews, unfortunately, you know, very few of them, sadly. But it's it's these little tiny glimpses, especially when it's you know they're they're gonna do they have to have the the sleep the clapper board for the next take and it's Bruce himself holding it or he's down on the ground and he's holding it or he's holding it and he's kind of smiling or there it's at the end of the day and they're kind of run down but there's Bruce again and he's doing the board himself you know it's just it really gives you that sense of how much of someone's self that they're putting in and you can clearly tell he's giving it every single you know bit of his energy and his spirit and you know he's putting 200 percent of himself into this and you know you can see that in in the actual footage but it's the in between take moments where you just get the sense of the man himself and I mean, it's absolutely priceless. It is priceless. It's it's little, little treasures, really. And it's this more than anything that really touches the heart and really makes you feel like you're there. And that's topped off by actually having the other two reels of footage that were thought lost with the famous uh, sequence that's known as the log fight. Well, that's here. And we also get the context of what that means because each of the sections of the eight parts is devoted to an entire sequence. Basically, again, a floor in the pagoda with some of the other eight parts being sort of miniature in-between documentary parts explaining the context of why production started and stopped and eventually getting to the point of which where uh, Lee stopped filming because he had to go and make Enter the Dragon because Warner Brothers came through with Fred Weintraub and in order to make the American financed film, Lee had to go and do it then and there and he thought he would just be able to come back to Game of Death later. So that's of course why Game of Death was unfinished and we will never quite know what Lee would have done had uh you know once he finished into the dragon and came back uh would he have kept going would he have started from scratch would he have reworked things significantly we we just simply don't know but this documentary the final game of death is the best exploration of not just the material but the whole story of game of death the whole story of the production of game of death what it was supposed to mean what footage did they shoot what footage did they not shoot what footage did they shoot first why was there footage that was shot outdoors with the various 
guards of the pagoda floors. Uh, what did that mean? What would it uh, perhaps have been used for? Uh, why were certain things shot at a certain time and not others? Uh, it follows the whole history of the production and the conception and the shooting history of the film and then where it stopped to then uh, go and make Enter the Dragon and then the sort of aftermath. And if that was not enough, we get to the eighth part, which is the conclusion, and then we go into a full reconstruction that Arrow has done, uh, taking the footage we have and the research they did to try and make the most uh, complete and fully realized version in terms of editing the footage and creating a new soundtrack with sound effects that felt of the period and using the actual dialogue that was meant to be spoken in the film from the, from the materials they had. So uh, this has been done before in different ways, and all of them have been impressive in, in their own right, but they all you know, took their own sort of approach. This is the first time we've ever had one that fully utilized every bit of material and every bit of research. And if that was not enough, they actually did a new audio mix with newly recorded dialogue and also used period-specific Golden Harvest sound effects. So outside of the dialogue sounding a, a bit more modern in terms of the recording, because it kind of has a more uh, slightly stereo feel while, while all the effects and music is mono, they went and tried to make sure all the sound effects and the actual bits of score they took from other Golden Harvest films of the same time period was as period-appropriate as possible. So it feels right in the soundtrack, too. And they, they took the time to sit there and construct and sync and dub all of this stuff to try and make it as cohesive as possible in terms of the sound design in addition to making the edit as good as humanly possible. So that's why it's great to see this at the end so that way when you've seen all the other raw takes and you've been going along in your head sort of building it as you go then you can compare notes at the end with the arrow version and if that were not enough they have actually created an entirely new introduction sequence where you have some look like sitting in a dark room with a projector and they basically were inspired by the footage at the uh, the scene at the opening of Enter the Dragon where we get the setup of Hans Island and and uh, Lee's character is given his mission briefing well, Arrow has basically done their own sort of low-budget version of that and used some of the outdoor footage to give the opening context to an audience to make a sort of pre credit scene, essentially, and they didn't have to do that. Uh, it it was it's just a really well thought out execute perfectly executed opening where they're obviously you know they don't have a lot of money it's just the guys at Arrow Video doing this and they made it work and it's a perfect way to open this because it gives you that important context of why Lee's character is even there even though they're limited to the footage we have and the research we have they're able to cobble this thing together and it's a perfect way to open this. And then they go right into a completely new, perfectly constructed opening title sequence designed to look like a Hong Kong film of the 1970s, complete with opening music, full opening titles, everything. It is, if this was not a treasure of, a, of, a, of an experience enough, that just makes, that, I, I mean, that, they, they did it so amazingly well that I just want to highlight that. The actual title sequence that Arrow commissioned and, and put together for their reconstruction of the Game of Death footage is exquisitely done. And when you get to this, that just will, you know, if, if you're a Hong Kong film fan or, or a Bruce Lee fan, that's just going to throw you for an absolute loop. It's just a a incredible surprise and then we get to the reconstruction of the footage and it's extremely well done and the best i've ever seen because again we're getting to use all of the footage because now we have all the reels and you can then see how arrow has gone in and done a really well executed edit of all the overall footage and with their new sound mix that has all the period appropriate uh, mono sound effects and uh, music cues with the new dialogue recording so it is a perfect uh, finish to this incredible documentary. It's the best uh, version uh, or, or re-edit of the Game of Death footage I've ever seen with the wonderful opening and opening titles. And overall, this is a mammoth documentary. It is, again, 
the best uh, documentary about a single film uh, I've seen since the uh, Dangerous Days Blade Runner documentary back in 2007. It's one of the finest film documentaries I've ever seen. Uh, it's the best documentary about an unfinished film I have ever seen, that's for sure. And even though it is simple in what what how what the actual contents are because you're just seeing the raw footage with narration uh, it's the links at which this documentary goes to and what it manages to convey is the spirit of the film game of death that was never completed it manages to convey the spirit and the goal of what bruce lee was after which was to try and finally make his martial arts philosophy felt and experienced by an audience in a feature film that was also a narrative film at the same time, that was still a film to entertain. So it was a very high concept film that sadly was never completed. It never will be completed. But in this documentary, you are finally able to feel the spirit of the film itself, and you can't help but think the the spirit of uh, Lee's philosophy, or or and certainly his his energy and his drive and determination and his sense of humor and his his passion for for making films and his passion for martial arts and and his own life philosophy. You can't help but feel that spirit in the room with you. So. I mean, personally, I think this is probably the greatest testament to Lee's career and his cinematic ovier that has ever existed. I think it's the best testament to the man himself. I think it's a better testament to the man himself than any of the documentaries about his life and career, which, you know, they, they all take different paths and... And some are really great, and some are a bit exploitative, like some of the Golden Harvest ones that I'll talk about later. But this manages to get across the spirit of the man himself and his body of work and everything that he strove for, I think, better than any of the documentaries that have ever been made about Bruce Lee. Uh, so, I mean, this is... This is not this is not an extra. This is not a supplemental feature. This is a full-blown documentary. This should be shown in theaters. This should be used in film schools without a doubt. It is a film school on a disc and the finest testament to I think Bruce Lee's entire body of work that has ever been. It is an incredible piece of work and was entirely put together, conceived, written, edited, directed by all the people at Arrow Video and Yes, it's amazing to see the Mandarin cut of the big boss. Yes, these 4K restorations of the films are amazing, and the audio restoration is amazing. But this documentary alone is worth every single penny of the purchase price of the box set itself, and I'm ecstatic that it is also being included in the standalone versions. This should be seen by anyone interested in how films are made, how films are put together, anyone who's interested in Bruce Lee, all Bruce Lee fans will get so much out of this, but it is, again, just an incredible piece of work simply as a documentary. Uh, so I, I want to stress this because it's not just an extra. It's not something to gloss over. I mean, I was... I, when I saw how long this was going to be, and you know, that's almost four hours, I, I knew it was going to be something special, but this is not merely something special. This is something truly special. Uh, it's one of the best film documentaries ever made, pure and simple. And, you know, I, I, again, I think it's the best, uh, you know, audiovisual testament to, um, you know, who Bruce Lee was as a cinematic artist, as a martial artist, as a person, um, and everything that he was striving for and everything that he wanted Game of Death to represent. So since we can never have the actual Game of Death that he was making and intended for, this is really the next best thing. It, it's truly a marvel. So here we have the beautiful artwork, which fittingly matches the design of the other Game of Death digipacks, but has the nice, unique white background. We have the matching spine. We have the interior using the wonderful black and white shot of Bruce used on some of the 1978 Game of Death advertising materials. We have the matching disc label. And then a lovely black and white printing of Bruce doing his famous air kick against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then we have the rear, which gives you the information about the final Game of Death and 
the extras on this disc, because not only is this uh, a nearly four-hour documentary, but Arrow has even included extras for their nearly four-hour documentary, because even that was not good enough, because... This is when people truly care about what they do, and they truly care about preserving not just the films themselves, but the legacy of how the films were made, what the films mean, and the legacy of the people who made them and put in their blood, sweat, and tears. So to go over these, we have Final Game of Death, a brand new 223-minute video essay by Arrow Films that incorporates a new 2K restoration of all two hours of Lee's original dailies from a recently discovered and a positive. Uh, this has English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. It also has the prior 2001 reconstruction, Game of Death Revisited, which was one of the earlier attempts to uh, work with the Game of Death footage and has a unique edit and audio dub. So it's wonderful they were able to include one of those here. We also fascinatingly have Super 8 footage from 1974 with Dan Innocento actually demonstrating I love the techniques and uh, focusing on the the uh, nunchaku for the essentially for the the Bruce Lee martial arts club that he was still uh, helping to uh, run and chair and to train people. So essentially, I, I guess this was something that was sent out to various clubs or you could get as like a mail order thing and thread it up on your Super 8 projector. So of course it's silent, but you actually have Dan Innocento himself demonstrating all these with, you know, the various moves and, and, and techniques having, you know, stills with the title. So then you knew what he was working on. So it was basically segmented out and it, it you know, it's pretty lengthy but it's it's a fascinating artifact from the time and and wonderful to see we also get a brief archival interview with kareem abdul jabbar from 1976 where it's it's very short but he talks a little bit about bruce and his experience making the film and then unfortunately uh bruce's passing before they ever got to complete the film uh then we also have a very an extraordinarily extensive image gallery filled with stills from all of the sequences of game of death it takes quite a while to go through it is is a it's an incredibly extensive photo gallery broken up into multiple sections around each section of the filming so it will take you quite some time to go through and is one of the most substantial image galleries I've ever seen on a disc release. And if that were not enough, there is also a separate extra that is uh, a compiling uh, most of all of the in-between take footage that I mentioned before that's so priceless, and it's basically condensed down into a five to six minute cut or edit of all of that. And when it plays out in succession, I mean, just the the... The intensity of those scenes is even uh, of that bit of, of those bits of footage is even more impressive and hypnotic. And uh, again, to just you just feel the intensity of of what this footage means and how priceless it is and, and how you just feel like you're there and you're just in the room and it's a time capsule. But you just get Bruce Lee's spirit just leaping off of the screen and to see all of this cut together, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's almost like the ending montage edit in Cinema Paradiso in terms of the the impact of it, and especially I think doubly so for for all Bruce Lee fans. But uh, it's just so incredibly uh, powerful seeing it all all of these little pieces cut together and 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 what all of this was was supposed to mean, and just seeing somebody putting that much of themselves into a into a work of art, and you know truly trying to express themselves to the ultimate degree and and putting everything they had into it and to see all these little bits just edited together is extremely powerful so that is the disc devoted to the astonishing final game of death documentary uh, again this is a blu-ray disc and it is region b locked so you will need region free capability to view this uh, but it, to say this is a work of documentary genius does not do it justice um I was not prepared for how incredibly hypnotic and powerful and moving and uh, just how, how how incredible this documentary was going to be. I know they just call it a 223-minute video essay, but it is a full-on documentary. This should be shown in theaters. This should be used in film schools. And it's the finest documentary on a single film I have seen since 2007. It's one of the best film documentaries I've ever seen, period. 
and just an incredible work and incredible effort from everyone at Arrow Films. And the entire box set is worth it just for this one documentary. This is a must-see and will for answer every question you've ever had about what was to be the original Bruce Lee film, The Game of Death. Next, Arrow has given us an entire disc devoted to Game of Death 2 and its alternate versions, some of which went under the title The Tower of Death or just Tower of Death. This was the second sort of patchwork film Golden Harvest decided to do a couple years after the 1978 Game of Death. And so in 1991, we got yet another film uh, purporting to be a quasi-Bruce Lee film, and once again utilizing footage and bits of uh, imagery of Bruce Lee, so bits of footage from his films are shoved into the main version of Game of Death 2 and most of its other versions. However, uh, this time it's mostly taking footage from Enter the Dragon, and the film is designed around those bits of footage right down to actually having a lot of the characters, or, or I should say the main character, costumed to at least sort of match uh, Bruce Lee. And also we have the same actor who played the head Abbott uh, or Bruce Lee's character's uh, teacher in Enter the Dragon actually sort of reprise his role here. And we also get the extra scene from Enter the Dragon that was only in certain versions and the one that was added back to the uh, to make the special edition cut for uh, everyone else in 1998. Uh, that is actually included here, along with the greenhouse fight that was cut from most international prints of Game of Death. Uh, so that makes this film a super sort of patchwork affair. Uh, despite the shameless reusage of footage, the editing is... Uh, you know, in, in some areas, maybe even better uh, than what was in the 1978 Game of Death, but it's still really shameless. Uh, there is one usage of unused Enter the Dragon material. It seems to be one particular scene of Bruce Lee walking into a room and looking at a, a book with his photo on it and sort of smiling to himself. We, we see that glimpsed here in Game of Death 2, and that's really the only footage that was not used in a Bruce Lee film that pops up here. So that little bit is unique, and that's one of the most important reasons to have this film here. But it's also, again, the second and last time Golden Harvest decided to try and do anything in regards to any sort of film involving Bruce Lee, and it was very much a follow-up to to their 1978 Game of Death. However, they didn't have Robert Klaus direct it, and Game of Death 2, in any version you see it, is quite bonkers, but in a rather amusing sort of way. If this were not confusing enough, certain versions, such as the Korean version, which is included here, uh, or I should say a version of it is included here, uh, dispenses with the usage of Bruce Lee footage entirely and has a radically different edit of the film and is significantly shorter. So there are versions that use different edits of Bruce Lee footage or different Bruce Lee footage entirely, and there's an alternate version that dispenses with that altogether and just has it as a standalone film without invoking Bruce Lee in any way, shape, or form. So none of this is easily understandable, just like the different versions of the 1978 Game of Death. Now, unlike the Criterion uh, Blu-ray box set and other releases of this that have included this film, uh, those merely used an upscale from Fortune Star. So if you watched Game of Death 2 on the Criterion box set, it was treated as an extra, and they merely used the upscale of an old master that Fortune Star gave them, and it was of rather limited quality. Well, Arrow was not content to do that, or they were able to convince Fortune Star otherwise. So this is a brand new 2K master of the film, or one that was more recently completed by, by Fortune Star in terms of the, the actual scan that was done. So this is another 1080p Blu-ray. It is not a 4K scan, and this is not a UHD, but this is a 2K scan and 2K master of the primary international version of Game of Death 2, and is far beyond the upscale presentation that was on the Criterion box set and uh, most other versions of this film you will come across. This is not to say that the picture quality is pristine. You need to expect some age-related wear to pop up. This hasn't been given a meticulous restoration, but it has at least had some restoration work done. Overall, the uh, marks and, and tiny lines and bits of damage 
aren't too terribly major, but you can clearly tell that this has not been given the, the same level of attention as the actual Bruce Lee films. However, to see it looking better than the upscale uh, on the other versions before this is, is a big step up. Uh, anytime footage from other films is used, it's obviously a dupe or, or ported in, so obviously the quality dips for those. Uh, they, you have the same sort of patchwork effect as you do in the 1978 Game of Death, although here it's a bit more apparent because the, there, there's just an error of this having a, a, a somewhat lower budget, and this is just a 2K scan without a lot of restoration work, and it hasn't been given the full 4K uh, red carpet treatment. So that makes that stand out a little bit more. Uh, I did spot a hair or two and some significant scratches in some areas, and there are also some spots where the damage is a lot more prevalent. So again, this is more of an as is presentation. It has been cleaned up a little bit, and overall, it looks rather solid and is far beyond the quality of the upscaled version on the Criterion box. Uh, but it's, again, this has not been meticulously restored or anything. I want to commend Arrow for actually uh, going the, uh, the extra mile to do this because this is an important part of studying Bruce Lee's filmography and seeing the after effects of Bruce Bloitation and uh, what Golden Harvest decided to do in both of their Game of Death films. Uh, this one has been much more obscure and really stuck in a lot of crummy versions. And again, before this point, all you really had for the most part were upscales of a much older standard Def Master. And that's no way to really see or experience a film on an official disc release. Uh, you do have to give this film credit, though, for the fight sequences outside of reusing the greenhouse fight from the uh, from Game of Death, 1978. Uh, it actually has really, uh, well, actually quite good fight choreography. This was done by by Yuen Wu Ping long before he became a, a bigger name in Hong Kong films and then uh, came over to the U.S. and even did the Matrix trilogy, among other things. So the fight choreography, while it is definitely not Bruce Lee's style, uh, it doesn't doesn't necessarily try to appropriate that for the most part outside of when you have the lead character uh, trying to be Lee-ish in the main Game of Death 2 cuts. Um, but it's it's quite impressive, uh, better than a lot of the stuff you see in the 1978 film in terms of the new footage they shot. And uh, it has a particular quirky sense of humor, I guess, and a whole lot of just bonkers moment so it's you know it's not boring let's put it that way <laughs> uh, and it does build to uh, quite an extended final fight sequence of course but uh, it's it's fascinating to see this in better quality and it definitely plays better the second time because the first time you see this you're just scratching your head and completely bewildered by what you're seeing so uh, I guess uh, pull up your your breakfast of raw venison and and uh and uh, dig back into Game of Death 2. Uh, now, Arrow also has put together another supplemental features package and alternate cuts of the film that are basing themselves off of this new 2K Master. So they're not treating Game of Death 2 as a mere extra. Instead, they have given it its own disc with alternate version presentations and its own extras as part of the final sort of uh, section of Bruce Lee's filmography, even though uh, this is merely the on the, the non-Lee uh, films from Golden Harvest. On the audio side of things, the English mono track is, is quite nice. It's also in lossless quality, and it does seem like it has been spiffed up and given at least some work uh, and some attention uh, as compared to the rather crummy version that was on the Criterion box. Again, uh, we are now getting to upgrade from that uh, upscale of a master from years beforehand that was actually standard def uh, to a full uh, brand new 2k master of the film so here we have the lovely package artwork with a nice image of bruce of course from enter the dragon because that is the uh, bruce this film is uh, gleefully lifting from and just stealing from <laughs> and then we have lovely custom artwork of our main character from the game of death 2 film of course have the matching spine and I like how they've included the Tower of Death alternate title on the spine and the cover as well. And then we have the interior with original poster artwork, the matching disc label, and then the very misleading and very Bruce Bloitation uh, alternative poster. And then here is the rear 
with the alternate versions and supplements for Game of Death 2, because again, Arrow was not content to merely include a random version of Game of Death 2. No, they have actually given it its own supplemental features package. So to go over those, we have the brand new 2K restoration of the international cut of the film with the Game of Death 2 title, which is done by Arrow Films from Original Elements. This is presented here on the 1080p Blu-ray, along with the Hong Kong theatrical cut, which went under the Tower of Death title. Uh, now, due to the uh, preservation of these sources, unfortunately, some of the unique edit and material in the Hong Kong cut is uh, actually uh, from standard def elements. So they did have to use certain pieces uh, and upscale them because that's apparently all that survives for the footage specific and the edit specific to the Hong Kong version of the film. Otherwise, it is made from this new 2K master. So once again, uh, Arrow had to go in and actually conform the 2K Master to the Hong Kong cut, but unfortunately they had to actually include some standard def elements to fully uh, reconstitute it. And we have, of course, the original English mono for Game of Death 2, and all three primary options for audio on Tower of Death in Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. We have uh, English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing for Game of Death, and then newly translated subtitles in English for the Tower of Death version, should you choose to watch it in Mandarin or Cantonese. If that was not enough, we have a brand new audio commentary just for Game of Death 2, which is a great listen. That's done again by Frank Jing and Michael Wirth. They talk all about the film, their history with it, the cast and crew, various anecdotes, uh, their experiences interviewing a lot of these people over the years, and uh, talk about the making and development of Game of Death 2, and also some about the alternative Tower of Death versions and the uh, very radically different alternative. Korean version, which I'll talk a little bit about more in a second. So it's a great commentary, and I just find it amazing that we now even have a commentary for Game of Death 2. That's how committed Arrow was to these films, that not only did they put work into Game of Death 2, they gave us multiple versions. Uh, we have this new 2K Master, and we even have a new commentary for Game of Death 2. So that's just... Wow, <laughs> to, to, to say somebody went the extra mile does not even begin to cover it. Um, so it's another excellent, must-listen, super enjoyable commentary and another excellent reason why this set is very much worth all of your hard-earned money because even Game of Death 2 has gotten a new audio commentary. Who would have thought? And then we have an archival interview with co-star Roy Horan, which I think was on some previous versions. So that's another uh, legacy extra brought in here. Then we have the alternative Korean version of the film. And as I said, this is a radically different edit of the film that actually starts with a scene that comes... I mean, about halfway through the uh, primary international version, when our uh, lead character, or I should say new lead character, uh, just arrives at the airport to, to pick up where our first character left off. Well, because the Korean version pretty much just removes all of the Bruce Lee uh, repeated footage and, and just all that stuff, we have a completely different edit that literally starts at the halfway point of the international version and shuffles a lot of scenes around and uh, drops some others. So we have a radically shorter film that in some ways actually plays a little bit better. And interestingly, they did shoot one of the main sequences in a secondary version just for this this particular edition of the film because the fate of a certain character um, in the international cut is now uh, that that same fate happens to a completely different character to set up this alternate version of the film. So this is not merely a shorter version of the film. Uh, this is really a completely different film. <laughs> so it's it's a, a, just a fascinating study because I, at first I thought this was just going to be uh, a, a short, a radically shorter edit. And then when I read that they, it removes all the Bruce Lee footage, I'm like, oh, well, how are they going to do that? It's just going to be really short then. Uh, but they, they drastically changed the film. A lot of people actually prefer this alternate shorter version. And I can actually see why. It stands on its own a bit more. Um... If you're going to watch this film, I think it should still probably stick with the international cut, at least for the first time. But um, it, it's such a, a, an oddball, wild, wacky kind of film that uh, it's it's kind of fascinating. There's this completely different version that's radically different and, uh, again, has some unique bits to it. So 
it's amazing that it could be included here. And again, they, they pretty much had to reconstitute it from their new 2K Master of the International Cut. And this does have Lossus English Mono along with the newly translated English subtitles. Now, something a, a lot of Die Hard fans have already been talking about a bit. Uh, apparently, this is the same iteration of the Korean cut that is the version that uh, I guess Fortune Star has out in some territories and is like the official edition. Well, but apparently, it's a, a little bit shorter than the uh, than another version of the Korean edit of the film or the Korean cut of the film that uh, I think was on VHS and and uh, has existed in, in other forms. And apparently the uh, version Arrow has recreated here that's the primary known Korean version in circulation uh, has a lot of little cuts in it that total to about four and a half to five minutes of footage that is only on this particular uh, version of the Korean cut that is in that I think was on an old VHS tape. There is a comparison on uh, the movie censorship database page, which I'll, I'll link to, so you can actually look at the differences. It's a lot of little frame cuts, and some pieces of fight sequences are, are not in the, uh, I guess, I guess you would call it the more official Korean cut. Um, so some people have been disappointed that the Arrow reconstruction and presentation of the Korean version of Game of Death 2 isn't necessarily the the purported full-length Korean version. Um, before this point, I wasn't aware that there was another Korean cut or, or multiple versions of the Korean cut of Game of Death 2, but apparently there are. So I, I guess it was just that Arrow had the uh, the I guess the purported official version to base their recreation off of um, I, I don't know necessarily where the other edition uh, actually came from other than that it, it has been preserved somehow on a particular VHS edition and now that's uh, got uh, some uh, discussion online going but uh, just so you are aware there is a longer version of the Korean edit of the film that is technically not included on the Arrow presentation so uh, there is a slightly longer by about four to five minute version of the Korean cut edit, um, but I, I, do, I just don't know enough about the history of the Korean version actually getting uh, re-edited or, or tweaked or shortened. But just so anyone is aware, that is a particular discussion among diehard fans that's been going on, and I had to look into it myself a little bit because, again, I just wasn't aware that uh, that the Korean cut had a different version out there. So if you see any discussion or, or anyone sort of uh, complaining about something on Game of Death 2 in the Arrow box, uh, that's seemingly what they are referring to is that uh, the Arrow reconstruction of the Korean cut from by using their 2K Master is actually slightly shorter than the longest known version that exists of the Korean version. Arrow also includes an alternative U.S. home video version, which is presented in a HD with lossless English mono via seamless branching and this again has a unique edit and also uses some different footage of other uh, Bruce Lee films so it's its own particular unique version that apparently was on select US video releases for a time and just for historical preservation sake Arrow has recreated also this version uh, using their 2k master as a base source then we get a trailer gallery which is again uh, pretty much standard of upscales but it's fascinating to see how they tried to sell Game of Death 2 or Tower of Death in different territories. Uh, and then we also get a rather nice image gallery as well to round out the entire disc devoted to Game of Death 2, a.k.a. Tower of Death. So uh, it's fascinating to see even this film get the royal treatment with extras, multiple versions, and actually a brand new commentary as well. So even though this is not a Bruce Lee film in any way, shape, or form, no matter what it tries to sell itself as, and while it's not even as polished as the 1978 Game of Death, it's amusingly bonkers, and the more times you see this, it kind of starts to grow on you in a particular weird way, and in in some areas, I think is a better film than the 1978 Game of Death, uh, because it, it kind of just commits to its wildness in ways that the 1978 film never did, and again, I think the fight choreography overall uh, is is quite impressive, even though it's it's you know obviously doing its own thing, uh, so this this is a rather interesting curio once again. 
again. So it, that's why it's important to have both Game of Death 1978 and Game of Death 2 as part of any study of Bruce Lee's filmography, because these are the two films that Golden Harvest did after his passing. And that kind of gave him some sort of legitimacy compared to all the other Bruce Bluetation films, uh, even though these themselves are obviously perhaps the kings of Bruce Bluetation films because they're officially made and sanctioned. Then we come to the final disc, which is devoted to the two vintage Golden Harvest documentaries, uh, Bruce Lee, The Man and the Legend, and Bruce Lee, The Legend. Now, both of these documentaries were part of Criterion's box set, they were part of Shout Factory's box sets, and they've been released many, many times. Um, they, they should be seen by, by all Bruce Lee fans and all newcomers, but they very much represent the times in which they were made, and neither of them do a super great job at what they're really supposed to do. Um, they each have some positives, but then they also have a lot of drawbacks, and, uh, to first talk about The Man and the Legend, this was released just shortly after Bruce Lee's death, and infamously, it basically starts out with all the footage Golden Harvest shot of Lee's funeral, uh, which is, it gets incredibly morbid and feels predatory uh, in ways towards Lee's family, and is, is very disquieting to see, and, and has basically no taste. Um, and this is, of course, where they got the footage of Lee's funeral that was then uh, shoved into their Game of Death film and even slightly in Game of Death 2 because apparently they'd never read the definition of the word tact in the uh, dictionary. Um, but after you, you get past the, the whole opening with all of the funeral footage and then uh, the, it, it, it gets uh, you know at least into... Lee's everyday personal life, although it's extraordinarily uh, morbid and odd because then they, they show Lee's house and his study and his personal items. And it, it's just, it's, it's very, uh, it, it basically goes behind curtains and doors that should not have been gone behind, particularly at that time. Uh, but it is very much a time capsule, so there there is that. And they do try to at least tell Lee's general life story and the story of his career, and it's also done at the time. So again, you get that sort of time capsule flavor. Uh, it's also done in the scope ratio as well, which is uh, quite interesting, particularly for a documentary at that time period, because they you know did design it for a theatrical release to you know throw it out there and and hopefully get get uh, all of Lee's fans to go and buy a ticket to see it. Uh, so it is a vintage scope documentary with film footage and film footage at the time so that's probably its best overall um, aspect but it does feel very very not the approach that should have been taken it is very disquieting and hard to sit through you do squirm a bit even when you revisit it um, which I don't really do all that often <laughs> but um, it, it is at least a historical document. And uh, here, the, the transfer is quite interesting because uh, this is apparently the, the master that Fortune Star provided, but it did have uh, dated clips from older masters of Lee's films. And what Arrow has done is actually go in and manually replace all of the clips from Lee's completed filmography with the uh, clips from the new 4K masters. So uh, you don't go to some random master with various issues and things when the documentary gets to the big boss and Lee's famous films. You actually get to see clips from the new 4K masters, and that meant that somebody had to go in and reconform this documentary uh, to include all of those same clips and have the same edit, but actually replace the old master clips with uh, the same clip sections from the new 4K masters and go in by hand and do those one at a time, and that's what Arrow has done. So uh, they definitely deserve full marks for uh, going to the extra effort of doing that. Uh, and then they also did that on the second documentary, which is Bruce Lee, The Legend. Now, this was done uh, 10 years later in the 1980s, 
and it seems like this was pretty much designed as a home video type documentary release or uh, maybe for television airings and then with eyes towards the home video market and then this was sold in a lot of different editions on VHS and, and also on DVD as well. Uh, both documentaries have seen a lot of different home media releases but uh, the legend being done during the video era it seems pretty much designed for that and it also seems like it was shot in standard definition. It wasn't primarily or entirely on film like the uh, Man in the Legend documentary was. So you will notice there is a definite quality difference in addition to it being in a non-scope ratio. So that means when you get to the 4K master clips that Arrow has put in here, they are from the new masters seemingly, but they've also crop them to like 178 to match the rest of the documentary. So uh, they they have used the new master clips, but they've also matched the edit and conformed the ratio to the ratio of the documentary. Uh, this is the better documentary overall. It's solid, if unremarkable. Uh, it does reuse some footage from The Man and the Legend, obviously, because they had that to pull from. But, you know, you, you can very much tell this was designed more around, you know, television airings or uh, having a home media VHS release, but it, it does do a better job overall of giving you the the career trajectory of Lee and it's it's okay but I, I don't think either documentary really gives you a sense of who he was as a person and and what his goals were and they're 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 each very much of their time but they should be uh, part of any collection because both of them are from Golden Harvest and they do have some really wonderful vintage interview pieces that are important um, but again I don't think either of them really does the does the does the man justice in terms of uh, covering his life and career in a single documentary again I think the final game of death actually is a better uh, is, is a better tribute to Lee's career and body of work than either of the feature documentaries here uh, but I'm glad they have been included and they have been worked on somewhat to try and improve their quality uh, to be as good as they possibly could be uh, and they are even an improvement over the uh, same uh, seemingly same or similar master presentations that were that were included in Criterion's box set so I, I do appreciate Arrow going in and actually putting in the extra efforts to uh, update and replace the uh, dated film clips from old video masters to be a the new 4k masters for all of them so here we have have the lovely matching artwork for the documentaries disc which is the tenth and final disc in the set we have the lovely matching spine then on the inside we have the poster for the band and the legend and the matching disc label and then we have bruce lee the legends poster which you can also very clearly see seems to have been designed with the VHS parameters in mind. And of course, this would quickly make its way onto home media. Then you have the rear with the information about the two documentaries and the list of supplemental features because even the documentaries disc has supplemental features. So to go over those, this is a 1080p Blu-ray presentation. So again, not a 4K UHD. These are not 4K transfers for the vintage documentaries. So this is another Region B locked Blu-ray disc. Uh, so we have 1080p presentations of both films with lossless Mandarin mono and English mono for The Man and the Legend and lossless English mono for The Legend documentary. Uh, then we have newly translated English subtitles for The Man and the Legend, if you watch it with the Mandarin track, and then subtitles for The Deaf and Hard of Hearing for both films. Then there's even an alternative video version of The Legend featuring different editing and credits. Uh, unfortunately, this is only in standard definition, so you will have to watch it upscaled, but uh, it it is uh, just, again, a different edit and version of the film, so uh, it's amazing that Arrow actually managed to uh, include another version of one of the documentaries. Then we get a fascinating uh, archival uh, piece because it's a, a, a basically a video of, uh, of a tour of Golden Harvest Studios uh, conducted sometime in the mid-90s by Russell Cawthorn, who was the writer of Bruce Lee the Legend. Uh, and so this is a fascinating look at, you know, basically at least getting some more modern-day imagery of uh, what the Golden Harvest Studio looked like, and sort of they're going around and pointing out the the sound stages and 
the conditions and things and, and also pointing out, you know, okay, this is where they would have done this and this is where uh, Bruce Lee would have done this and this is where they would have built the street set for Fist of Fury, for example. And so you basically get that sort of uh, firsthand perspective of the sort of layout of the stages and things at Golden Harvest. Then we rather wonderfully get the alternative Hong Kong titles for Enter the Dragon. This is a completely different title sequence, very much in the style of the Golden Harvest uh, Bruce Lee films with Lalo Schifrin's iconic Enter the Dragon theme. Uh, but it's fascinating to be able to see in high quality, in the scope ratio, in HD nonetheless. So this is uh, just Arrow going the extra mile yet again. And even though they couldn't do Enter the Dragon and uh they i guess they couldn't specifically make any new extras about it uh they did take the time to actually include an hd scan in the scope ratio of the alternative hong kong enter the dragon titles which as far as i'm aware i don't think any warner release has ever done that so uh, it's one of those alternate sequences that not a lot of people are aware of until they stumble across it but you can actually view it here and while it's not as good as the primary uh, English titles, uh, it's fascinating to see and should be preserved and is a wonderful inclusion here. Uh, then we also get trailers for the documentaries and then uh, pretty nice image galleries for both documentaries, including some of their physical media releases. So that is the final disc for the two primary featured documentaries, uh, Bruce Lee, The Man and the Legend, and Bruce Lee, The Legend. Now we move on to the actual artwork, packaging, the box set itself, and then all of the printed supplemental materials. So here we have the limited edition box set with the uh, limited edition exclusive artwork and design. Uh, the standard edition is the same box set design and has these same uh, printed materials and same disc contents but has unique artwork for the box and the digi packs uh, this has a rather nice lift top design and then this also has the uh well i guess it's still the the j card which has all of the information and the ratings logos but this merely slips off like so and then we have the same artwork underneath. So here it is without the uh, covering J card. And I have all of the discs out of this right now because it's, you know, it's it's a little heavy with everything in there. So I figured while I was handling it, I just have it empty. So it's easier to hold on camera. So again, we have the same artwork on the sides with the list of titles as well. And then the exclusive artwork on the limited edition for the rear is the beautiful rendering of Lee from his iconic Game of Death pose. And, of course, the yellow of the limited edition box, along with the black on the sides, uh, is replicating and referencing the iconic yellow and black tracksuit from Game of Death. Of course, standard looking bottom. And then what's really nice in terms of just the overall effectiveness, I think, is the top. If you notice, it seems to also include Lee's signature as well. So I just I love that little touch, along with, of course, having the Golden Harvest logo everywhere on the box, almost making you want to immediately start humming out the iconic Golden Harvest dum 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 uh, from the Golden Harvest logo. So, of course, the box top merely lifts off. And also, if you notice here, they've even added the extra touch of having the dragon motif sort of framing uh, the, the discs as you lift them out. And then on the back side, I, again, love this touch. They've included the Golden Harvest logo yet again. So both sides are uh, pretty much adorned with the dragon representing Lee, and the Golden Harvest logo. Now, getting everything in and out at one time can be a little difficult, and since you want to be careful with digipacks in any box set in terms of getting them in and out, it does help to sort of lift several of the digipacks out at any given time to more easily uh, take things in and out of the box set. So, as always, you do want to be careful with sets like these that have digipacks, uh, because you don't want to damage them and you want to be careful sliding things in and out. Uh, and because this is, you know, a lift top box instead of a side open box, you do have to be even a little bit more careful than usual. So now I have everything back in here. So you get the experience of taking the top off 
and seeing everything in here. So as you can see, this is pr pretty much uh, stuffed entirely with the contents, and very nicely Arrow has uh, put all of the titles on the spine uh, relatively high up, so when you just uh, have everything in here, you can uh, relatively uh, easily see the title that you're looking for uh, if you've just, or if you're looking at the spines and you can just, you know, slot out the particular one that you're wanting to view. As you can see, the actual uh, contents are stuffed to either side. So again, it is a better idea to just take a few out at a time uh, because it's a lot easier getting them in and out than just trying to do one at a time. Now, this is the same sort of hard case style box for the outer case that you see on a lot of boutique labels like Arrow and especially like Indicator. Um, I, they, they obviously wanted to give a premium sort of feel for the 10 discs and everything with this set. So I understand having the oversized box approach. Um, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to use, but it is a beautiful display piece. Um, had they gone for um, multi-disc digipacks or, or not use 10 individual digipacks, it maybe could have been a little bit slimmer. But again, they, they were trying to go for uh, a more premium a uh, larger style box footprint so again uh, that's that's why we have the bigger box uh, because it is done to accommodate all of the goodies inside and the 10 discs and the 10 individual digi packs now uh, it's been well discussed that uh, a lot of people had issues getting copies of this set from arrow and other other retailers without uh, getting copies that were rather dinged up or had some damage um, i think simply due to how these were manufactured and the larger heavier nature of these sets I think that's what caused a lot of this um, for for most people it was relatively minor stuff but for such a bigger and uh, more expensive set it was a little a little disquieting and, and I know some people did try to uh, get uh, exchanges or, uh, or 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 try to uh, or, or did complain and did get partial refunds um, this particular copy I, I received um, it's in great shape overall but as you can see, there's a little tiny bit of some corner ding uh, on, on some of the corners. It's nothing major, but it's entirely due to this being a heavier box. And uh, all of this seemed to happen at the, the factory when these were made and produced. And it seems pretty much commonplace and widespread on all the, the different editions of this set that people have purchased that you're likely to have some sort of, of corner ding or, or crumpling a little bit. Uh, not everyone has, but it simply seems due to this being a, a bigger, oversized, heavier box and also just part of the manufacturing process. So it's it's nothing major. I'm, I'm not really worried about it, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. If that sort of stuff really bothers you, that's something you will have to look out for with this particular set in either the limited version or the standard edition. So now to go over the printed materials, we have to start with the extremely impressive, very hefty uh, book with this box set. This is exclusive to the box set and is a hardcover, hardbound, 200-page book filled with an essay for each of the films, including the documentaries and Game of Death 1 and 2. Uh, we also have tons of stills of Lee and production stills in regards to each film in addition to credit lists, and then a whole bunch of additional essays and supplements in the back. Uh, this is extremely well done. It's also done on very glossy, thick paper for each of the pages. So you know, it's almost got the feel of like, you know, photo quality paper. So this is not a, a cheap book by any means. This very easily could be sold as a standalone book on Bruce Lee's life and career in a bookstore. And you'd pay full price for it because it is literally done to that level of standard. Uh, to briefly mention some of the other essays in here, Andrew Staten's uh, piece, The Early Films of Bruce Lee, is literally a run-through of Bruce Lee's entire, you know, pre-Big Boss filmography, which is just fascinating to read through. He goes through and describes every single one of the films, most of which are uh, not able to be viewed, unfortunately, but... 
you can read some about each and every single one of Bruce Lee's starring parts or, or roles in films uh, as a child and throughout his young life uh, in Chinese films and Hong Kong films, uh, which is just a fascinating inclusion and something that I never thought I'd see a complete run through of Lee's pre big boss filmography in large detail and then it goes in and also talks about his television roles uh, his green hornet role his uh the uh green hornet batman crossovers on the batman series his long street episodes just basically his entire acting career pre the big boss and of course we even have more images of Lee scattered throughout, wonderfully done. And there's also a fascinating piece entitled Fields of Fury, The Rise of Golden Harvest, where Dylan Chung goes over the entire startup history and basically how Golden Harvest was even developed when Raymond Chow left the Shaw Brothers studios. And he goes into great detail about what Golden Harvest meant and how it developed and even how they coined the name. So that's a fascinating inclusion here. Uh, there's additional pieces about the uh, various BBFC edits to Lee's films over the years and how they developed over time. Uh, there's, of course, all of the technical notes. There's a guide to the restorations for each and every film. And there's the production credits, the thank yous, and then probably most importantly, uh, the real brains behind this set. Uh, James Flower writes on page 175, an entire viewing guide for Bruce Lee's films in this box set. And basically, this is where newcomers need to go as soon as they open this, because uh, he writes an entire guide to not only the versions of the films, the audio tracks, but also the presentations in this set and what the goals were and then how you can proceed from the uh, default versions and the uh, various cuts to then some of the other cuts of the films and the other audio tracks. So this is where uh, they, they, they very much get into more of the details about some of the differences in the other versions. Uh, the menus are all well labeled and they'll, they'll kind they give you an idea, but uh, this, uh, the viewing guide is the place you need to go to uh, when you're starting this box set. And uh, of course, they've gone into great detail here. So this is a really impressive book. And I, I think Arrow has outdone themselves yet again with, uh, with the book for this box set. And uh, in terms of books, this is, you know, pretty much indicator level of quality, which is my, my top tier quality standard for, you know, best uh, box set books in the business for boutique labels. So this is, this is right up there as one of the best box set books I've ever come across. And here in the the uh, the box set itself, you get the wonderful hardbound quality, and here in the limited edition, the actual book matches the box set design. And then we have the replication of the iconic yellow and black tracksuit motif as well. If that were not enough, we also have a poster replica of the original British quad uh, sheet for the Big Boss, beautifully printed here with the gorgeous red background, and this is actually double sided because it's backed with the gorgeous British quad poster for The Way of the Dragon. So these are wonderful reproductions, very easily frameable, done to a nice quality standard. But I, I also love it that the images they chose are from my, my two favorites of, of Lee's filmography. But uh, that's what they chose for the uh, poster reproductions. But we're not done with printed materials. We have an entire case with beautiful artwork of, of Bruce in flight, essentially, <laughs> and then backed with the wonderful ad tagline, Bruce Lee is dynamite. But this is actually a, a, a lift top little box case that contains a whole bunch of printed art cards. And there's so many in here that you actually have to be a little careful getting these in and out because they're just, it's literally filled. So you, you do have to kind of well you do have to kind of struggle a little bit to get all of these out because there's just so many in here and what these are are double-sided reproductions of what seem to be the original british lobby cards so they go in order of each film and seem to completely reproduce the lobby cards for each film and each of them is backed with their respective 
uniform posters. So all of them have the, uh, the all the Big Boss ones have the Big Boss poster on the back. These are done on really nice thicker cardstock. They're done to a really great standard. The color reproduction is really well done and they're done in a nice size too. So uh, these are some, some of the most uh, nicely done uh, lobby card reproductions I've seen in a modern set. And they seem to have done all of them because there's so many that I'm just astonished that uh, because usually you, you especially nowadays uh, most box sets if they're going to do something like this it's just a couple or if it's like a studio releases maybe one or two but you certainly don't expect to see pretty much what seems to be the entire lobby card run for all of the films reproduced in, in, in their entirety I mean this is just uh, again to, to say Arrow went the extra mile just I mean, this alone just conveys that. So, of course, we have to have beautiful shots from Fist of Fury, backed with the Fist of Fury poster. These are just extraordinarily well done. This feels like me when I run into a disc where it's not done to this quality level of care and standard. Then we move on to shots from The Way of the Dragon which is backed with the poster artwork. I'm kind of tilting these some so there's not, uh, not any glare on the images just to try and get across how well done these uh, printings are. And then we move to Game of Death, which of course had to also use stills of Bruce Lee to sell the film as a Bruce Lee vehicle. And then of course the rear has the matching poster artwork. I can't imagine why all of the lobby cards for the 1978 Game of Death would be focused on the Bruce Lee footage, can you? It's almost like they were trying to sell it as a Bruce Lee film. <laughs> And then these nicely slot back in to their little uh, case here. But again, there's so many of them and they're, they're rather thick that you do have to kind of be careful getting these in and out. And then uh, if that were not enough, Arrow has actually included some more uh, printed images and they've actually given these their own nice little uh, plastic bag holder. She even has a resealable flap. And what I said before about the pages of the actual book having a sort of photo glossy paper finish, Arrow has actually included real photos printed on real high, extreme high gloss uh, photo quality paper. And these are all stills from uh, the sort of start of Fist of Fury. So this is the famous imagery of Bruce in the white suit, seemingly in the dojo from the film, but with the uh, very cool looking slick back hair. Um, you know, these images are, are, are really famous and iconic in their own right, but to have them reproduced here on full photo paper with a full glossy finish, I mean, that's just, uh, that was completely unexpected. So uh, it seems to be uh, all of these photos from the, the same session, and they're all done to this same wonderful degree that uh, it's just like you're literally get, you've got your own photo prints of these now um, just incredibly well done and just something that was totally unexpected so it does seem to be all the shots from this uh, photo session or at least all the major ones have been replicated here and of course it does make you wonder what it would have been like had uh, Bruce actually had this hairstyle in the in the film Fist of Fury Again, uh, the, the the camera images don't really do these justice at, at how well done these are. I mean, these are these are complete photo reprints. You can frame all of these, and they'll they'll look great. So these these are completely frameable. Again, apologies for any glare. I'm trying to hold these and and try to keep the uh, trying to keep the glare off. This is me when I think once again about Warner's bare bones, poor encoding of and sort of uh, corner cutting Enter the Dragon UHD compared to the effort seen here. What's that? The Criterion and Shout Factory box sets? No, nah. we, 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 don't, we don't need to talk about those anymore. Just absolutely incredible extra effort. I mean, 
this you, you don't see this type of effort given to just included photos in a box set. I mean, this is just this is again something else. So that's it for the printed materials of the box set, and that brings the overall contents to a close. So uh, I want to finish off by just giving an image of the actual credits here and the thanks page, but in particular the, the credits of all those at Arrow who put this box set together and really put in the time and due diligence that these, that these films have deserved for decades and never gotten before this point on home video, in particular in getting the picture and sound as right as humanly possible and producing what is easily the best presentation that these films have ever seen outside of when their original theatrical release prints were brand new. Um, this is an absolutely incredible effort and all due to the people's names you see here, uh, all of which at Arrow Video have outdone themselves. Oh, let me try to get all this back in here. So that is my review of Arrow Video's Bruce Lee at Golden Harvest set on 4K UHD and Blu-ray in its limited edition package. This again, unfortunately, has already sold out. The standard version with the same disc and printed contents is still available, but Arrow has already announced that is very close to selling out, so you should definitely pick it up sooner rather than later. Uh, thankfully, they have announced their standard editions of the films are coming out with slipcases, custom artwork, and a shortened version of the book contents will be included with the film-specific essays uh, in each film release. Now, most, uh, well, all the disc contents will be the same, so they'll have the special features. Uh, Way of the Dragon will include the incredible must-watch final Game of Death disc. Uh, the only things you are losing from the box set will, of course, be the full hardbound book, the uh, beautiful printed photo supplements and lobby cards, and the poster reproduction, the unique box and box artwork. But you'll also be losing three discs from the box set. You'll be losing the alternate versions on the 1978 Game of Death disc. You'll be losing the Documentaries disc. And of course, you'll also be losing the Enter the Dragon disc because that was just the 2013 Warner Blu-ray anyway, which most of us already had some form of. So it's really just the two discs that you're losing, the Documentaries disc and the alternate versions of Game of Death disc. And since those also have their own particular unique extras, it, I think it is a good idea for fans to try and get the box if possible, but uh, I can understand waiting for the standalone versions because they will also be a lot more uh, budget friendly. And uh, thankfully, Arrow has been able to include the, the vast majority of the supplements here, but uh, you will lose out on the full impressive overall box set package and list of supplements. So overall, uh, while it does have uh, quite a hefty price tag and it is an import title and you will have to have region free capability to view the actual Blu-ray discs themselves, uh, this is easily the, uh, I mean, pretty much the definitive presentation of Bruce Lee's filmography in terms of the Golden Harvest films, just, you know, not, not really counting Enter the Dragon. So when paired with Warner's uh, bare bones and pitiful in comparison UHD of Enter the Dragon, uh, you have the best possible presentations of Bruce Lee's filmography. And with the additional extreme efforts that Arrow Video has gone to to create the most comprehensive uh, package of supplements uh, defining uh, Bruce Lee's work and career and filmography that has ever been assembled, which totals to around 65 hours of, of time. Uh, this is just a, a real mammoth of a box set. And the, the just work of people who truly care about what they do and truly care about these films and uh, a whole team who wanted to try and present them in the best quality possible while overcoming a lot of the drawbacks and not so good ideas that really marred a lot of their previous presentations in both picture and sound and in the technical realm, uh, while also generating new extras and uh, keeping as many of the legacy extras as they could to try again and again make the most comprehensive package overall and the best overall set that not only represented Lee's body of work, but 
gave it the proper context and respect that it deserves, even though it unfortunately was so uh, tragically short-lived and meant only a few feature films to, to his filmography. But this is just a, a, a new level even for Arrow in terms of uh, raising the bar higher in terms of physical media, but also film preservation, because this is also a matter of preserving these films in the best possible uh, ability we have in 2023 and making them available in that best possible quality for current and future generations and newcomers alike to have access to these films and have access to these amazing extras that Arrow has uh, created and cultivated and brought all together to give the necessary critical and historical context to understand why these films are so important and why they've lasted all this time and why they really are timeless. It is a fitting tribute to Bruce Lee's body of work, to his cinematic legacy, and, you know, easily the best uh, presentation that, that his films have ever seen on any physical media release format. And they do make all previous releases of his films on home video you know, pretty much obsolete outside of uh, certain uh, legacy extras being exclusive to older releases or, you know, say, for example, some of the extras exclusive to the Criterion or Shout Factory box sets. So if you're a diehard fan, you'll obviously want to hang on to those for specific extras that are unique to those sets. But Overall, nothing holds a candle to this. This is a must upgrade, and thankfully everyone will be able to get the standard editions if you uh, didn't have the budget for the box set, or you didn't want to spring for the whole box set, or you missed out on the uh, box set in terms of uh, both versions selling out. Uh, there will be a wide release uh, standard, well, I should say spe standard special edition of, of the main films, and so you will be able to get uh, most of the discs in the set. It's just the the it's really just the two uh, not we're not really counting the enter the dragon um sort of uh, placeholder disc uh it's really just the two discs uh for alternate versions of game of death and the documentaries that will remain box set exclusive along with all the printed extras so uh, i do highly recommend everyone uh, check out at least some version of this this is such an incredibly impressive effort. You know, I, I don't see anything really challenging this as box set of the year. I mean, that seems pretty much a no-brainer. Uh, again, it's 65 hours of supplemental features, uh, right down to all, uh, all or most of the alternate cuts of the films having to be rebuilt from scratch by by the team at Arrow and reconstituted using their these new 4K masters that they that they did and supervised. So, you know, that alone is. Is just even more additional effort on top of completely new feature commentaries for all of the films and uh, just and then you get to the final game of death and of course the mandarin cut of the big boss and the overall quality jump in picture and sound i mean Every penny of the purchase price is uh, spoken for and warranted. Uh, there, there is no downside to this. It is, simply put, one of the finest box sets I've ever seen in physical media. And every single facet of this release was made and designed and pulled off by people who cared and people who cared enough to put in the extra effort and go the extra mile and not really leave any stone unturned. There is no stone un left unturned here. And that's what really just jumps out at you the whole time. And it will take you a while to go through all 65 hours of supplements. But by the time you, you do so, you have done a college level crash course in uh, the works of Bruce Lee and the history of the Golden Harvest Studio and the history of Hong Kong films and the history of Chinese films. And of course, the history and development of the martial arts film as we know it and the entire Entire genre, so uh, you 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 will get so much value for your money here. It is one of the finest box sets in all of physical media. It's one of the best UHD releases I've ever seen. The UHDs on a technical level are executed beautifully with incredible, perfect encodes by Fidelity and Motion. Uh, this is just uh, across the board an absolutely stellar effort. I cannot put enough superlatives on this set. And if all of that were not enough. 
it is topped off by the inclusion and creation of the final game of death documentary, which is one of the finest film documentaries I've ever seen and worth the entire purchase price alone. Uh, and it's going to be something that I think all of us return to time and time again. This is a reference work. This is a physical media reference work, and it is the perfect tribute to Bruce Lee's filmography and his body of work. It's the type of or well, really it's the type of tribute that I think everybody would hope to have um, to to their body of work, regardless of, uh, you know, what medium they're in, but especially in, in motion pictures. This is the type of career tribute that you would hope somebody would 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 generate at some point and and continue to, to carry forth the, the torch of your cinematic legacy, if you will. Um, it's just just a. a, a a physical media release that is truly unbelievably respectful and devoted to presenting these films in as best uh, a quality and as best light as possible and so far advances on all the versions and iterations that have come before that it just wipes the floor with them. I mean, nothing compares to these in terms of the attention to detail, the care that's been put in to every facet, and that no stone has been left unturned. That not only the picture, but the audio has been given a full restoration for all the films. That even Game of Death 2 has a new scan and master and Blu-ray and multiple cuts and a feature commentary. I mean, that is just, it is an absolute marvel of a physical media release. This is one of the best physical media releases of all time. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is a superlative effort and is in the absolute pantheon of greatest home video uh, physical media releases of all time. There's absolutely no question. It may very well be the best box set that Arrow has ever done up to this point. And uh, quite frankly, I, I think it is. Uh, it is just an absolute marvel of an effort from Arrow. So uh, the Arrow video release of Bruce Lee at Golden Harvest, which is available on both Blu-ray and 4K UHD Blu-ray combo box sets, is absolutely one of the finest box sets I've ever come across. It was a pleasure and a delight and inspiring to go through this box set and see somebody knock it out of the park to such a degree that it, again, it raises the bar for everyone. This is the type of quality standard that everybody should be aiming for at all times. And unfortunately, it, 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 this happens so rarely that we have something this superlative across the board that um, it at least gives you hope in terms of physical media, I, I guess would be the best way to put it. Hope that, uh, you know, more releases and more releasing entities can, can hit this sort of level, uh, you know, so... I, this gets my highest marks. I, I, as as always, I hope that my my babblings about physical media and films and film history and of course Bruce Lee's body of work have been at least somewhat fun and informative. I hope I have convinced you to at least check out this incredible release and the and the incredible efforts put in by Arrow Video for handling the Bruce Lee filmography. I mean, this is just an incredible work, not just for physical media, but for just film culture and uh, film history and the preservation of, of film history and presenting films with an archival mindset that it's just mind boggling. And again, this has 65 hours of supplemental materials and alternate cuts. So you will spend weeks going through this and you will spend ages returning to this time and time again because it is a reference work. It is a reference box set. This is something to keep on the shelf and to pull out like a reference book. This is, you know, it's an encyclopedia. It's a multi-volume encyclopedia, but it is a film reference work. This is not simply a mere physical media release. And again, it is topped off by the Final Game of Death documentary, which is absolutely astounding. So please do keep supporting incredible efforts like this by purchasing films on physical media to help keep both physical media and film culture alive. Please do go and support the incredible efforts put in by Arrow Video with, with this release. Uh, even if you're just going to purchase the uh, upcoming uh, standalone special editions, uh, those are filled with almost the same entirety of the 65 hours of supplemental materials and feature the same amazing discs and disc encodings of these 
beautiful new 4K masters for all of Lee's films, and then the Blu-ray presentations for, for the other alternate versions and other films. It's just an incredible effort, and I'm very thankful that people will be able to experience these and the upcoming standard editions at a much uh, more wallet-friendly <laughs> cost per disc, uh, and you're, you're not going to lose out on all of the amazing supplements here. Uh, it's just, uh, again, just two discs in particular and all the wonderful printed goodies that you will lose out on but at least we will have impressive standard editions for people to check out so please do enjoy the arrow video release of bruce lee at golden harvest by enjoying these discs by going through every single facet of this release and all of the incredible supplemental features and printed extras and thus keep your disc spinning to help keep physical media and film culture alive and as always thank you ever so much for watching these films have now been properly taken care of with an archival mindset. I must go and move on to other films now. In this world of film transfers and physical media releases, wherever the crusader goes, he will continue to analyze film transfers and disc releases on his own.